Good morning. This is a hearing on the Committee of Agriculture entitled The State of Infrastructure in Rural America will come to order. I've asked uh, General Bacon to uh, open us with a prayer. Don. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll pray. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for the privilege of living in this country where we're free. And we just thank you for our, our farmers, our ranchers, our agriculture, which is such a rich resource for our country. You've blessed us. And Lord, we ask for your wisdom today and for your presence. And we just ask you that you help us do a, a good job for our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, based on the level of conversation before we start the hearing, apparently everybody's excited about uh, our topic today. This is, uh, this is good stuff. Again, thank you for uh, being here. Appreciate it. There's perhaps no current public policy proposal that commands more bipartisan support than the idea of rebuilding America's public works. We've all heard the news reports about the impact aging infrastructure has on our ability to trade, travel, and communicate. But perhaps nowhere is the need to renew our infrastructure greater than America's heartland. Many Americans are familiar with the crumbling bridges and buckling roads that are highlighted in the news stories, and the, crisis, the tragic crisis in Flint has brought into sharp relief the urgent need to upgrade our water supply infrastructure. Like urban America, rural America has its share of roads, bridges, and water systems in need of repair. We face a unique challenges that are different than our neighbors. Rural America produces commodities, that, the, the commodities, those fundamental products on which we build our modern economy. We produce food, fiber, energy, ore, lumber, and everything else that gets into the products that are made in our factories, factories that in many cases reside in urban America. And transportation is the lifeline that facilitates this partnership. If we cannot get the commodities to market, urban manufacturing For uh, right now, this one's live. Try it now. Try it now. Check, check, check. Who's that? That's me. All right. Is it working now? Okay. Speaking of infrastructure needs. Uh, like transportation, improved communications technology remains a tremendous need in rural America. Here in this room, we take for granted the awesome power of smartphones. Universal, instantaneous access to the internet has become essential to our lives. And as communications technology races ahead, we need to ensure rural Americans are not being left behind. Further, many of the gains in rural America over the past 100 years <clears throat> have been due uh, in part to the public investments made in agricultural research. As we Gains in rural America over the past hundred years have been due in part to the public investments made in agricultural research. As we've heard before, the infrastructure on which our world-class agricultural researchers rely is outdated, crumbling, and even as other countries are making significant investments. At the root of many of these problems is the need for capital to be invested in rural America. Our shifting population, moving out of rural communities and into urban and suburban uh, counties, is also shifting the tax base, making it difficult for small communities to finance the upgrades they need to continue to be competitive in the modern economy. It's a cycle that seems unbreakable. Services are lacking, so families move out. As families move out, the tax base shrinks, and as the tax base shrinks, services must be curtailed and upgrades must be postponed. While it's tempting to think it's a local problem, it's not. Our modern economy is built on the free movement of goods and ideas. We cannot grow our nation's economy if 50 million rural Americans are, are unable to participate. 
For 200 years, Congress has debated federal financing of waterways, highways, electric systems, uh, telephone lines, and research infrastructure. Across all of those debates, we've, had long, we've long understood the need to continue to pull all Americans further into the networks of commerce. I applaud the President for drawing attention to this important issue. Today, we're fortunate to hear from six of, our, of over 200 organizations participating in, rebuild rural, uh, re, in, built, in re, participating in the Rebuild Rural Coalition. And I want to thank them for, and the many other coalition partners for joining us here today. It's important that your members and our constituents are part of this process. With that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Peterson for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for uh, being with us. And apologize, I've got to go down in the hall and testify on my wolf delisting bill. So <laughs> I'll be back, but I, I might miss it. Anyway, uh, as the Chairman said, it's no secret that we've got the infrastructure um, issues and uh, we've been in decline. Uh, roads and bridges are in need of repair. Um, and if we don't do it now, it'll just cost more later. Our rural economy is, uh, in particular, uh, faces unique infrastructure challenges. And uh, as was said, the strong uh, infrastructure is necessary in rural America because it's so remote and we depend on it to get our products to market. Uh, I know it's surprising to a lot of folks, uh, but in my district and others like it, there are large areas that lack broadband service. And there are USDA programs to build more broadband, but uh, the problem is we don't have a sustainable long-term funding source, and uh, we need something like the Universal Service Fund that we had when we built out the telephones. Uh, that's the only reason we got telephones out to every part of rural America. And in my opinion, unless we, don't, unless we have something like that in place, that can be relied on, we're not going to get this broadband done. You know, it would kind of fits and starts and uh, states are doing things and so forth. So uh, somehow or another, we've got to figure out how to do this. It's not as easy to do on the broadband as it was with telephones, but I think we can do it. There are, um, are a lot of com um, components uh, that are overseen by f different federal agencies. And uh, if we are truly going to rebuild we and keep our rural infrastructure being here today. I look forward to the testimony and I yield back. He's responsible for our at experiment stations, cooperative extension service, uh, and the College of American Manufacturing Dollar. If you've got a witness you'd like to introduce? Pleased to introduce Mr. Curtis Wynn of for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Mr. Wynn has won creative work to support local communities. They've developed and implemented pioneering financing, community solar. Mr. Wynn is the perfect voice to help this committee Mr. Wynn. Thank you, Ms. Adams. We also have uh, Ms. Jennifer Otwell from uh, District 11, which is kind of near and dear to my heart. Jennifer is the uh, Vice President General Manager of uh, uh, Totalcom Communications, LLC, De Leon, Texas, on behalf of the Rural Broadband Association. And uh, Mr. Vila, would you like to introduce our witness? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, for hosting. General Manager of the East Rio Hondo Water Supply Corporation, 
Uh, he was. Appointee on the president. Additionally, Brian serves as vice president of the Texas Rural Water Association Board of Directors and president of the South Texas Water Utility Managers Association. I'm happy to ha I'm happy to have you here today, Brian, and thankful that you are here to highlight the water needs of South Texas and of all rural America. Uh, thank our witnesses. We're going to have to take about a, a seven eight minute break to reboot the system. So please, everybody stay where you are, otherwise this may can go on. So we'll reboot and try to move forward. So everybody, hang with us.
agenda, the Republican agenda, and President Trump's agenda. The letter states, we urge you to preserve existing rules, practices, and traditions as they pertain to the right of members to engage in extended debate on legislation before the U.S. Senate. We are united in our determination to preserve the ability of members to engage in extended debate in bills on the Senate floor. Each All right, let's try this again. If, the, uh, if this problem persists, we will simply turn them all off. I'll ask the witnesses to speak loudly so the stenographer can capture what you're speaking, and we'll not be able to broadcast this thing out further than that, but uh, uh, we will move forward. So with that, Mr. Alverson, five minutes. Oh, by the way, given this delay, given the importance of this and how much all of our members are, are interested in this, I'm going to be really strict on the five-minute clock. If you see the red light go on and I start banging up here, then I'll need you to uh, rewind it up real quickly. And then, uh, members, please understand you got five minutes, and then uh, I'm going to have to move on to the next person. So with that, Mr. Halverson, your five minutes. Well, good morning, Chairman Conway, Ranking Member Peterson. service providers. CoBank partners with many farm credit associations to finance an additional $9.4 billion in loan commitments to rural infrastructure. We partner with commercial <coughs> banks to add $1.6 billion more in commitments to that sum. And as a cooperative owned by our customers who live and work in rural America, our primary interest is maximizing the quality and the availability of infrastructure to rural communities. Hospitals, senior care centers, walk-in clinics, schools, and other community facilities are critical to the viability of rural communities and are important contributors to the quality of life for rural families. In many rural communities, those essential facilities are not available or need modernization. A pilot program authorized by our regulator, the Farm Credit Administration, helped to address the need for community facility investment. Farm Credit was able to invest $733 million in 210 rural communities, catalyzing commercial bank investment of an additional $315 million on almost half of those projects. That pilot program expired in 2014, and we would hope that this committee will encourage the Farm Credit Administration to facilitate a new sustainable program to resume these critical partnerships between Farm Credit, commercial banks, and the USDA to support rural community facilities. GAO estimates that almost $190 billion is needed to cover the costs of replacing outdated rural water and wastewater infrastructure. There continues to be a well-publicized digital divide between urban and rural broadband subscribers. 
The Federal Communications Commission estimated that nearly 40% of rural Americans do not have access to the current FCC target for ideal minimum Internet service. That lack of access slows the deployment of technology, hampering efficiency on our farms, limiting other business opportunities, and threatening our local and our rural communities. Rural America helped pull the country out of the Great Recession, thanks to the strength of agricultural exports and rural energy production. In recent years, however, the rural economy has suffered due to low commodity prices and other difficulties. All of us should be looking for ways to support the health and the vitality of, of the rural economy during this period of challenge. And infrastructure investment is one of the best strategies to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today, and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tom. Um, the, apparently, the clocks in the, in the uh, lights are not working for the witnesses. So at, with 30 seconds left, I'll give you a tap on the gavel uh, as a heads up. So with that, Mr. Coon, Great. five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coon, sue me. It, it's fine. Tom, that's what my mom called me. Thank you, Chairman Conaway, uh, Ranking Member Peterson, and uh, Congressman Lucas, and other uh, honorable members. I'm honored to represent Oklahoma State University uh, and the Association of Public and Land Grant uh, Universities, or APLU, here today. I also want to thank the Rebuild Rural Coalition uh, for including agricultural research infrastructure in their initiative. The Farm Credit Council, the American Farm Bureau Federation, and other members of the coalition clearly see the connection between the innovation that comes from agricultural research uh, at the nation's public uh, schools of agriculture and the positive influence research has on economic development in rural America. The Rural Prosperity Task Force, led by Secretary Perdue, also calls attention to the challenges that our rural communities face today. Because most agricultural production takes place in America's rural landscape, research that strengthens agriculture's future helps to support strong school systems, health care systems, and thriving businesses in rural America. My message is simple. First, prosperity in agriculture and rural communities has depended on public investment in research at our agriculture schools. Second, the future of that infrastructure is at risk. Those of you on the Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research Subcommittee heard testimony from Dr. Jay Ackridge of Purdue University in March about the importance of federal funding in support of agricultural research. In the 19th and 20th centuries, that support transformed American agriculture and made our industry a world leader of innovation. In June, deans from public and land-grant universities in Florida, California, Alabama, and Texas described ways they've leveraged the federal investment in agricultural research with state, local, and private funds to continue growth and innovation in their state's agricultural economy. In 2015, the APLU commissioned a study to document the state of research facilities at public schools of agriculture. The study collected data from 91 schools and included nearly 16,000 buildings and 79 million gross square feet of space. The replacement value of that space is $29 billion. The total value of deferred maintenance across the 91 institutions is $8.4 billion. Of this, $6.7 billion, or 80 percent, is in facilities that are more than 25 years old. Agriculture colleges are funding maintenance at about 60 percent below the university average. And because buildings require more maintenance as they age, the combination of older infrastructure and underfunded maintenance is undermining the productivity and dependability of our research enterprise. The USDA Agricultural Research Service works closely with public universities, and in fact, 30 percent of their research is conducted in facilities of their cooperators, most of which are universities. In 2012, the ARS released a capital investment strategy that is complementary to the APOU study. The ARS has facilities valued at $3.7 billion. The report stated a need for $148 million in annual maintenance funding and another $100 million in annual expenditures to replace aging facilities. It is clear that public agricultural universities need to tackle these facility challenges on two fronts. One is that we need to take better care of our facilities. The other is that we need to replace much of that outdated infrastructure. Deans tend to fund faculty lines at the expense of infrastructure needs, and that needs to be recalibrated. In addition, we need to be honest and transparent about the real costs of research. For example, the USDA limit on facility and administration costs that can be recovered is, is at, set at 50 to 60 percent of the federally negotiated F&A rates 
and that undermines our investment in facility maintenance. We need to invest aggressively in new facilities and major renovations. We propose a funding mechanism whereby federal funds are used to leverage other investments into our research infrastructure needs. Federal funding is especially important for addressing research needs in the national interest. Federal funds should come with some expectations and contingencies. They should be competitive. They should address national or regional needs, and they should be matched with state, local, university, and or private funds. The need is great. We project a need to replace $20 billion in infrastructure over the next 10 years. If our federal partners can invest half of that, it is incumbent on us as deans to raise the other half through our other partnerships. 30 seconds. The competitiveness of our agriculture sector, the security and safety of our citizens' food supply, and in large part their health, as well as the health of our environment, depends on the research our scientists produce. The challenging investments that the partnership made in our research infrastructure in the 20th century have created a dynamic, innovative, and job-creating food and agriculture industry and a safe and secure food supply today. We owe it to future generations to make the investments that will ensure they benefit from the bounty of our tremendous natural resources and uniquely American collaboration between scientists and the farmers, ranchers, and workers in our nation's food and agriculture systems. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Calhoun for five minutes. Good morning. I'm Rick Calhoun, the immediate past chairman of the Waterborne Commerce Committee of the National Grain and Feed Association, on whose behalf I testify today. The NGFA was established in 1896 and consists of 1,050 member companies that handle approximately 70 percent of the U.S. grain and oilseeds crop. The importance of infrastructure to the success of U.S. farmers in competing to provide Americans' agricultural bounty to consumers is undisputed. But by numerous markers, America's infrastructure is falling behind. We've fallen out of the top 10 in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. We used to be able to ship soybeans to China for nearly $80 a metric ton cheaper than Brazil. Today, they've narrowed the transportation gap by about 75% to just $20 a metric ton. The American Society of, of Civil Engineers' most recent infrastructure report card doled out the following grades. Roads, D. Inland waterways, D and bridges C+. NGFA appreciates their new sense of urgency by Congress and the Trump administration to enact an infrastructure package that includes a reliable funding mechanism to recapitalize our dilapidated inland waterways and restore our rural roads and bridges. Today, I'll focus on the 12,000 mile inland waterway system, which supports 540,000 jobs and provides the lowest cost, most fuel efficient and environmental friendly way to transport grain and ag products. Most of our locks and dams have exceeded their 50-year life design, and it's starting to show. During the past decade, work stoppages for repairs have increased 700 percent. And in 2005, Hurricane Katrina halted our ability to ship on the inland waterways and ports, sending barge rates up as much as 50 percent and causing basis values on corn to decline 40 to 70 cents per bushel. We appreciate that Congress has begun to respond. Thank you for, for passing the WERDA Acts in 2014 and 2016 to streamline projects and for increasing operation and maintenance funding for locks and dams. Also, President Trump recently visited the Ohio River to put an unprecedented presiden presidential spotlight on the state of our locks and dams. But to bring our waterway system into the 21st century, a new approach is needed. Here are some ideas that we believe would help you get the biggest bang for your buck. Priority one, support stronger federal investment in U.S. locks and dams. Currently, there are a portfolio of 25 critical inland waterways projects that need to be funded to modernize the system at a cost of $8.75 billion. Also, the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund has $9 billion surplus, and Congress should ensure these funds be spent to maintain U.S. ports and harbors through dredging. Priority two, support the existing public-private partnership to finance our locks and dams and oppose unworkable tolling and lockage fees. The Inland Waterway System benefits from a successful P3 where the barge and towing industry, but ultimately the U.S. farmer, pays 50 percent of the cost of the Inland Waterways projects through a 29 cent per gallon diesel fuel tax, which is matched by federal dollars. Perennial calls to impose lockage fees and tolling on the Inland Waterways by past administrations have consistently been rejected on a bipartisan basis by Congress. Commercial users of the Inland Waterway locks and dams are the only private entities that pay into this trust fund, even though the benefits are freely enjoyed by numerous other stakeholders. 
Therefore, the question should not be how much more can we extract from those who pay, but rather how can we get the other beneficiaries of the system to support it. Rural America also relies heavily on roads, roads bridges, and, and, and highways to transport ag products from farm to market and provide access to education, jobs, health care, and social services. But the roads and bridges that connect the country's rural areas face several significant challenges, including inadequate capacity to handle commerce, limited connectivity, and deteriorated conditions. Congress should explore prioritizing increases in federal funding and or reclassification of rural roads and bridges to be eligible for funding. One concept that may warrant your consideration is to develop a system of block grants where states and localities with feedback from rural and ag stakeholders could pri prioritize road and bridge projects they deem most important. One final thought. By 2050, the world will be, will be challenged to feed 9 billion people. If we maintain the status quo on infrastructure investment, we will seconds. fall far, fall short of meeting that demand. We need to be pragmatic. Let's not f allow under $9 billion in waterways investments to stand in the way of our ability to better feed our country and the soon to be 9 billion people around the globe. Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Calhoun. Uh, Mr. Wynn, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Conaway and Ranking Member Peterson uh, for inviting me to testify today. My name is Curtis Wynn, and I am the President and CEO of Roanoke Electric Cooperative. We are a member-owned not-for-profit distribution cooperative, and we serve 14,000 rural co consumers, customers, in some of the poorest parts of our state. That's why, above and beyond just delivering electricity, I think we have a calling to provide a broad set of services and support to help our community thrive. Among our biggest challenges going forward are adapting to changes in consumer demand, accommodating an evolving generation mix, and protecting against cyber threats. I'm going to talk today about some investments that my co-op is making to modernize and meet these needs. I'm aware that resources will be limited in the upcoming farm build, but I believe a separate infrastructure package gives us a great opportunity to make further investments like these to ensure the success and stability of rural America in the 21st century. For decades, the Rural Utility Services Electric Loan Program has been the foundation of what we do, providing low-cost financing to co-ops for installing and maintaining the grid. Today, RUS also helps us fund more advanced projects to make our systems more modern, efficient, and secure. We have enjoyed strong support for robust RUS funding because we're such a good investment for the federal government, providing valuable services to our communities and reliably paying back our loans. We ask that you help us maintain that support. In the 21st century, robust communications infrastructure is just as important to our business as our traditional assets like poles, wires, and power plants. My co-op is, is currently investing $4 million to lay a fiber communications backbone in our service ter territory. Our main motivation is to take care of our internal operational needs to make our system more efficient and secure. However, once this foundation is in place, there are lots of things we can do with it. One option could be providing broadband internet to our customers' homes. Many people in our region don't have access to reliable internet. That puts our consumers, schools, hospitals, and employers at a disadvantage. I believe it will take many different types of technologies, partnerships, and engagement from all stakeholders to address this challenge. As Congress thinks about infrastructure and telecommunications policy, we believe all potential providers who have a community need and a willingness to engage, including some electric cooperatives, should have access to a diverse set of tools to help bridge this digital divide. For years, electric co-ops across the country have provided information and advice to consumers to help them use electricity more efficiently and cost-effectively. Because we don't have a profit motive, we have a unique opportunity to help our co consumers use less energy and save money. For example, at Roanoke, we have a program called Upgrade to Save, where we work with our member owners to make energy efficient re retrofits in their homes, like adding insulation or replacing old HVAC units. Customers immediately began to save money without making any upfront payments. 
and by sharing the energy savings, we ensure full cost recovery for our cooperative. We can do all this through a $6 million loan from the USDA through a new energy efficiency and conservation loan program. In the first 18 months of the program, we've worked with local contractors to retrofit over 200 homes with an average energy savings above 20%. 20, 20%. That's after the repayment of the note. We also recently used a USDA Rural Energy for America program grant to build through our power provider a community solar project. Now, our members have the opportunity to purchase energy from these panels, investing in clean, renewable energy and lowering their monthly electric bills. Lastly, the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program at USDA provides financing so that co-ops can partner with local schools, hospitals, emergency services, and businesses to fund projects that create jobs and meet our community's needs. 30 seconds. Since 2012, North Carolina has been involved with 99 red leg projects that created over 2,600 jobs. Most of our country's food, minerals, energy, and manufactured goods still come from rural areas. That's why the health of rural America should be of interest to all members of Congress and to all Americans. You have a great opportunity in an infrastructure package to make needed investments that will address our unique challenges. We look forward to working with you and thank you very much for this opportunity, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Ms. Atwell, uh, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Conaway, Ranking Member Peterson, and other members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about the importance of rural broadband as part of rural infrastructure, how that infrastructure is built and maintained, and the needs of rural consumers. Totalcom recently built fiber to the only hospital in Comanche County, Texas, enabling countless important functions, such as sending CT scans and other diagnostic imaging to radiologists in faraway metropolitan hospitals. It is essential for our county seniors and other residents to have our hospital nearby, and that wouldn't be possible without a high-speed, high-capacity broadband connection. This is one of many examples I've witnessed during my tenure at Totalcom of broadband making the rural way of life possible, to say nothing of the agricultural and energy production and other rural goods and services that broadband makes more affordable and available to a global market. Simply put, broadband is now essential rural infrastructure, yet it's an expensive undertaking. Totalcom serves an area of around 1,182 1, square miles with an average of only 3.4 customers per square mile. You can do that math. That's not enough customers to recoup the cost of delivering broadband over such a large area. But 59% of Totalcom's customers have access to speeds of 10 megabits or greater, and 29% of our customers now have access to speeds of up to one gigabit, thanks to our recently completed Fiber to the Home project in the town of DeLeon. These results are similar to what other small rural telecom providers have achieved around the country, and none of it would be possible without support from the USF High Cost Program, which helps rural carriers make the business case for providing the service and securing loans from USDA's Rural Utility Service, CoBank, and RTFC, which are among the very few lenders committed and willing to finance broadband-capable plant in rural America. Indeed, our U.S. loans and high-cost USF support work in concert to help deploy broadband where it is not and sustain and improve it where it already is. For purposes of a congressional infrastructure initiative, let me reiterate that affordable financing is essential to rural broadband deployment, but it's not feasible without the presence of direct support for recovering the cost of providing the service. Providing rural broadband is an ongoing effort that requires sustained commitment, we cannot declare success just for the very preliminary act of connecting a certain number of locations. Congress was quite visionary in calling for reasonably comparable services and rates between rural and urban America in the 1996 Telecom Act. The FCC was wise to follow this principle by drafting rules for USF that mandate robust networks that can be readily upgraded over time to meet increasing consumer demands and expectations. Anything less would deny rural consumers the educational, economic, health care, and public safety benefits of broadband that other Americans take for granted. While USF rules are designed to support robust networks, its high-cost program budget currently is not, as it has been under the same hard cap since 2011. Meanwhile, other USF program budgets have grown considerably. This hard cap is now driving consumer rates higher, 
deterring rural broadband investment, and even cutting USF support for investments already made. The artificially low, high-cost budget is the greatest barrier to rural broadband deployment today. Because the USF high-cost program is designed well but underfunded, we encourage Congress to offset this shortfall via any infrastructure package. This would help address the funding shortfall and save time and resources that would otherwise go towards creating and administering a new program from scratch. Thanks to recent reforms, the high cost program is already designed to put support where it is needed most and avoid wasteful overbuilding of existing networks by targeting very specific locations. Also, efforts to standardize and speed federal land permitting processes would free resources for broadband investment. And loan processes could be improved by allowing environmental and historical reviews to be conducted after funds are obligated but prior to disbursement. In short, the best funded, best planned networks may never fully deliver on their promise if they are caught in regulatory red tape and needless delay. While small rural carriers have done a remarkable job of leveraging available resources for broadband deployment, much work does remain. 30 seconds. 15% of NTCA member customers don't yet have access to 10-1 broadband, while 90% of Americans have affordable access to 25-3 service or greater. The broadband industry is eager to close this gap by working with Congress and the administration on policy that helps to build and sustain broadband in rural markets that would not otherwise justify such investments and ongoing operations. Thank you for the honor of testifying today, and I appreciate and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Otwell. Uh, Mr. McManus for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Conway, Ranking Member Peterson, and members of the committee. Rank Vice Ranking Member Vela, thank you for your kind introduction. It is an honor to testify before you on the drinking water and wastewater infrastructure needs and concerns for rural America. I am Brian McManus, and I serve as the general manager of the East Rohanda Water Supply Corporation in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. In 1979, East Rohanda began construction of its potable water system with our first USDA Farmers Home Administration loan of $1,100,800 to serve 975 customers. These customers were farmers, ranchers, rural, and colonia residents who were utilizing a mix of contaminated and non-potable water sources. The enormous cost to start a water system over such vast rural areas was not a possibility without the grants, low interest loans, and 40-year terms that USDA funding made possible. The dollar value of the current infrastructure needs for water and wastewater in rural America can be tied directly to the current USDA rural water application backlog of $2.5 billion for almost 1,000 pending applications. East Rohondo currently has an application pending for approximately $4.5 million for a new 1 million gallon elevated water storage tank. This backlog truly represents my utility and rural and small community water infrastructure projects throughout the country. Why does rural America water and wastewater infrastructure matter to the average American? It's really simple. First, the people living in rural America produce the food, fuel, and fiber products for our entire country and depend on safe and clean water to maintain their health and their community's economy. Second, all American citizens depend on safe drinking water in rural America for the safety of their food supply, as it takes clean, potable water to wash and process the fruits, vegetables, and meats at packaging facilities in rural America. Third, the wastewater treated and discharged by rural American communities is likely the drinking water source for the next community downstream. Although small drinking water systems outnumber large water systems 10 to 1, they still have a minority of the country's population, often at a much higher cost per household. As a prime example, East Rohondo has constructed a UV light disinfection treatment process at our surface water treatment plant to inactivate cryptosporidium, which was detected in our raw water source. This project cost East Rohondo approximately $1.5 million in capital construction, or $191 for each and every connection in our system. Lack of economy of scale is also demonstrated by East Rohondo serving 7,850 connections with 466 miles of pipe equivalent to 16.8 connections per mile. Much larger urban utilities can have hundreds of equivalent connections per mile of pipe and more easily spread infrastructure costs over their larger customer base. USDA funding is what continues to make growth and compliance projects truly affordable to rural America. In 2017, there are still rural communities in the country that do not have access to safe drinking water or sanitation due to the lack of population density or lack of funding. My associate, Finley Barnett, general manager of SUN Water Supply Corporation in Merkel, Texas, is seeking USDA funding for the expansion of his system to serve 300 rural residents whose wells have gone dry. 
My entire rural neighborhood hauled bottled drinking water to our homes due to private wells with salty groundwater until 2009 when East Rajondo laid a new pipeline on our rural road. My next farm over neighbors, Richard and Cheryl Johnson, were ecstatic to have safe potable water from East Rajondo as they had both been previously hospitalized due to fecal contamination of their private well from their septic system. A very crucial point to take home today is that rural America is being overlooked in the funding as currently proposed to partially occur through the US EPA's state revolving fund process. SRF dollars have historically been absorbed by large metropolitan water utilities. East Rajondo's experience in applying for DWSRF funding is that our applications historically rank too low and have largely been unsuccessful. East Rajondo's and NRWA's preferred funding avenue for water and wastewater infrastructure projects is the USDA Rural Development Direct Loan and Grant Program. NRWA urges Congress to consider the following rural water and wastewater infrastructure concepts. Number one, provide a minimum set aside for small and rural communities. Number two, provide grants, not just loans. Number three, contract qualified private nonprofits to service the USDA water and wastewater loan and grant programs. The current checklist for a USDA loan and grant project requires an applicant and their consultants to complete 90 separate items before beginning construction. 30 seconds. This checklist is included in attachment C of my written testimony. NRWA would like to thank the Rebuild Rural Coalition for organizing this effort today. Thank you, Chairman Conaway, Ranking Member Peterson, Vice Ranking Member Vela, and members of the committee for allowing me to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you very much. Chair, remind members that they'll be recognized for questions, questioning in order of seniority for members who are here at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of arrival. And again, I appreciate my, the members understanding the uh, strict adherence to the five minute clock. Now I recognize myself for five minutes. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. It's uh, clear uh, the challenges facing the uh, infrastructure issues across the entire spectrum of uh, infrastructure with respect to uh, rural America. And uh, the witnesses have laid that out really, really well this morning. I appreciate that. Ms. Otwell, one of the fundamental concepts behind uh, uh, federal communications policy was this universal service. In other words, everyone should have a landline. Um, can you talk to us about why that was important in the past and why, looking forward, that we need to morph that concept across the entire spectrum of uh, communications? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the concept of universal service is that no matter where an American lives, if they're lucky enough to be in a rural area or if they live in an urban area, that they should have access to equal services at reasonably comparable rates. Um, it started with voice services, and it was a huge success for rural America. We got everyone connected. Now we're connecting everyone with broadband, which is the connection of the present and of the future. And I think it's even easier to see the benefits of a broadband connection with the educational opportunities, telehealth, telework, some smart farming initiatives. Broadband makes everything more efficient. And I think the concept of universal service is something that everything represented at this table can agree upon. The fact that whether you're connecting people with water or electricity or actual highways or the information superhighway, that the continued uh, connection to that regardless of where you live is what continues to make America the land of opportunity. The, um, I wish the rest of us were as co cooperative as the uh, cities of uh, Comanche and De Leon were. With respect to your hospital, it's about equidistance between the two communities and uh, is a great uh, example of a good partnership. Mr. Calhoun, I live in a relatively dry part of the Texas. Uh, we call the Pecos River a river, but uh, it would only be called that uh, in Texas. Uh, help us understand how, is, how do we go about communicating to those who don't really have an appreciation or direct contact with locks and, and uh, in the waterways of our country to make sure they understand it's important. What's the, how can we do a better job of communicating that? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. It, it is, it's a tough thing to do because the further that you are away from a navigable river, the, the less important it would seem to you. But I would, I would contend that there's so many different things from airplane jet fuel to agricultural products to coal to steel to cement, everything that builds and rebuilds America and will make it great again. Uh, a lot of them move on the waterways, and, and we just need to continue to tell our story. And the real, the real key is getting people within this body, the, within Congress, to understand the value of it and, and getting your colleagues that, that don't understand the value of the rivers and the navigable nation to, to understand them better. I think that's one of the things we can continue to do as well as, as educate the, the general public. But education, as we all know, is a, is a difficult task. Sure. I appreciate that. Mr. Halverson. Uh, CoBank and, and your colleagues were very uh, um, uh, nimble 
with respect to droughts in Texas and the ability to, to uh, get access to uh, capital or gap funding. Uh, by comparison, the USDA uh, projects take and uh, partnerships, or how can USDA uh, projects take and get a partnership model help expedite a project uh, funding uh, in, a, in a more nimble way when you have droughts that you're trying to respond to? Well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we are, as a you know, privately owned cooperative, uh, try to be as extremely uh, responsive in terms of time, terms and conditions to our customers as we can, whether the situation that they face is a wildfire or a, or a flash flood or, or, or what have you. Uh, we work with lots of partners to that end, be they partners in the farm credit system, uh, the Department of Agriculture, state and local authorities, uh, or, or whichever is, um, uh, combination is most appropriate. Uh, we uh, value particularly our relationship with uh, USDA, and we look for ways to expedite those situations uh, to the maximum degree possible when they, when they arise. I appreciate that. Again, thank you, witnesses, for uh, your being here today and, and uh, being really clear with the needs of uh, rural America. Mr. Peterson, five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Otwell, um, I had the Minnesota Telecom people into my office yesterday, and they were telling me that um, for $200 million a year, we could get broadband everywhere. And I, in your testimony, it says it's $110 million. What, uh, <laughs> is, what is is what is the number, do you know? Absolutely, I can speak to that. So the rural community-based carriers that NTCA represents, we currently have two paths for how we're gonna go about regulations, these updated regulations. Uh, both are significantly underfunded, though the first is a model-based path, and that one ties a certain number of locations to a certain amount of money. That one is underfunded currently by $110 million. And we know, because it's tied to numbers and locations, how many consumers that affects. So that's gonna affect 70,000 rural Americans that are gonna get less broadband than they would under full funding, and 50,000 additional rural Americans probably will receive no broadband because of that underfunding. On the other side, the non-model side, it's actually worse. They are underfunded for the next 12 months by $173 million. And that represents money that has already been invested, but the support mechanism is underfunded so much that they did not receive that recovery of $173 million. So what that means is they plan their infrastructure projects for 2018, 2019, and forward, they have to make up that difference. That, that difference has to come from somewhere. So that means lesser deployment to the tune of, of that amount. So that's where we get those different amounts. So this, uh, this is money that is used to actually put the system in place. This so that is, is not actually, necessarily the money to keep it running once it gets there. That is actually the money to keep it running. In it rural is. America, because we have so few customers per square mile, right. we need that ongoing support to make the business case to be there in the first place. So, um, you know, I think one of the reasons, from what I, what I know, the um, Universal Service Fund worked for telephones is that we had a tax on the bill. And so you could collect it from everybody. Uh, but we don't have a tax on the Internet. So there's no way to collect anything on broadband service. So what we're doing is we're collecting money on the telephone and we're using some of that for broadband. That's, and that's that, why when I hooked up my hunting cabin, I had to put a, a landline in even though I didn't want one because that's what I had to do in order to get um, internet, I guess. You are absolutely correct. So part of the the changes to our regulations now, we no longer would necessarily need to require that landline. However, because it's so underfunded, the average company, in order to provide standalone broadband, would cost $226 in our area to provide standalone broadband, and that's not an, a reasonable cost compared to urban America. Um, but you're exactly right, that's, that's part of the problem. Well, my, you know, I've got some co-ops uh, that have really done a great job. They've They've taken money from RUS and other places, and they've gotten one gigabyte service to every community in their, in their service territory. Uh, we have other places that don't have anybody out there serving them because the big companies abandon those folks, and there's no co-op in that area and so forth, and so they got nothing. So I've been trying to figure out you know, how we can uh, work this out, and it's very frustrating. Uh, you know, We had one situation where this, the city in this county had service, and the state had a grant program that would have worked to extend it to the rest of the county, 
But the two big companies that I won't mention that were in that city vetoed it. So they're not only, they not only abandon these areas, they're actually standing in the way of us getting service out there. You know, so then I had the electric co-op come in and try to talk them into going into the business. Well, they looked at the situation and because there's no ongoing funding to make up the shortfall, they decided they couldn't do it, you know. So somehow or another, we got to figure out how to get a funding stream, as I said in my statement, that is uh, there on an ongoing basis so people can go out and extend this stuff out there and, and make it happen like we did with telephones back in the 30s, you know. And whatever we can do to get that done, sign me up. Thank you very much. Deal back. Jim Yost back. Uh, Mr. Austin Scott. Five, um, yeah, Austin, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just wondering if maybe the telecom companies can tell us where that hunting camp was. We could. I'm kidding. I'm just picking on you, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Otwell, I read your testimony, and one of the, the one issue I take it with it uh, is that you say we're paying more for the same level of service. I would suggest we're paying level and not paying more and not getting the same level uh, of service in rural America. I live in a uh, little town of Tula, Georgia, uh, in between uh, Tifton and Ashburn, and while certainly Ashburn has had its challenges with internet services, uh, Tifton being a little larger has, has done better, but uh, you get into those small towns that even are pretty close to larger areas, uh, our service is subpar at best. and. It was interesting that uh, my neighbor decided to try a different route because they were so uh, uh, they weren't satisfied with what they currently had, and so when they tried that different route, and the different route didn't work. Then they had to go back into a waiting list to even get uh, back on the the internet service that they that they had before, which again was uh, a little slow. I appreciate you mentioning. Uh, Com South and, and Hawkinsville in my district, they're a great company. I want to mention um, one of the things that has become a concern to us in Georgia um, with a different carrier up in the northern part of the state is that they take money to expand the networks, um, but it is the, uh, it's the CAF funds, I believe, is that, that correct, where they're actually supposed to, where maybe those funds are being taken and, and, and not being used uh, for the proper purposes and maybe being diverted to other projects. What type of accountability measures would you suggest so that we make sure that the money that is going, that, that we as Congress put into uh, expanding access actually gets used for access instead of supplanting funds that the companies would have put into those areas? That's a great question, Congressman. I appreciate that. Um, so whenever we talk about the small company, the rural community-based carrier, Universal Service Fund, some of our reforms have recently been updated for more accountability. For example, uh, all companies, no matter which model or which regulation path you took, every year we have to report geocoded locations to all the locations we build broadband to. And if you're in that model-based path, we actually even have to, uh, to report locations we previously have built to. So at the end of that 10-year period, the FCC will have a geocoded map of every single place that we have broadband service. We also are not receiving support in certain census blocks. So census blocks that are deemed either too low cost for the high cost area or have a competitor already serving without support, those blocks are not eligible for support. So our system really has been built to only put the money where it is desperately needed and to enforce build out requirements in those areas. So, so you mentioned one thing that I think we need to revisit and that is competitor. It seems to me that one of the problems is that once someone receives a grant for an area, if they're not doing a good job in that area, nobody else is eligible for a grant in that area when, when maybe they would do a better job for the people. It, so is that that's not correct? untrue. And what you're mostly talking about there are areas that we call the It is or it's not true. It is true or it's not true. The others may not be eligible. That's right. You're, you're correct about that. Those are, what we could, those are what are in the price cap area, so that's your larger providers usually. There are lots of rural areas that they cover that there is not as much accountability for. So in an area where, say, Windstream had taken a grant to expand access but maybe did not do what we expected them to do with the grant, we could not, because of the way the current law is written, you can't turn around and, and 
support somebody else that, that may come in and, and, and do what, what the funds were intended for. So for example, a company like mine, we could not come in and receive funding for that area. Most of these areas are, are your higher cost areas with fewer consumers. And so without that ongoing support, there's really not a business case for one network, much less two. So we do try to not be inefficient in our building and using funds in the same sure. area. Uh, but but that is a that is an issue. But my, my concern is where we've where we have allocated federal money to expand it. It's not being used by the company as we intended for it to. But then we can't we can't help somebody who actually would compete with them. Now there there is an option um, in some of the latest reforms. Some of those companies can turn in some of their areas that they're not serving. And there's an gonna auction do that, process. Though, you, we're going to have to. They're not going to voluntarily turn in those areas. Um, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, but I hope that we'll continue to look at that area because a lot of money's being taken and then not used for the purpose that it was intended for. Chairman, time is expired. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, and as we approach this issue of rebuilding the crumbling infrastructure, there's another pressing need that we need to attach to that. And, you know, I believe strongly that divine intervention and divine providence has played an extraordinary role in the movement forward of our nation. Um, and nowhere is that more prevalent than in our having the right people at the right time in the right places. And we've had many great presidents, two of which are FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who gave us the New Deal, and Dwight David Eisenhower, who gave us the building of the highway interstate system. Both men at the right time. But it wasn't just that. It was the fact that they utilized these public works programs to address lifting up the employment and the opportunities and training that strengthened and brought in a new era in each time. And as we move to rebuild this crumbling infrastructure, we got another problem, and that is the crumbling family infrastructure. We have an extraordinarily high unemployment rate, which is accompanied by the opiate crisis. And where is that happening? no greater place than where we are going to rebuild the crumbling infrastructure in our inner cities and in the rural areas. Where among our American young men, the unemployment rate in some of our rural and urban centers is a staggering 41%. And so I would like for us to take a look at a bill that we have introduced in a bipartisan way. Kevin Kramer and I, my Republican friend and I, have come up with a bill that would use this public works, private works partnership as we move to rebuild the criminal infrastructure, much as Dwight David Eisenhower used the highway bill, much as Franklin Delano Rosa, without which we never would have survived. We have a severe opiate crisis throughout our community, but nowhere is it more piercing than in the rural areas, families breaking down, joblessness, hopelessness. So we put sent a House Resolution 52 together that would direct our Secretary of Labor to connect on-the-job apprenticeship training programs that would help in these areas. Our American families right now are in a crisis, uh, particularly as it appeals to our young men between the ages of 18 and 39. And so we hope that we can uh, address that as we uh, move forward. And um, our bill is HR 52. And my colleague, Kevin Kramer, and I, General from North Dakota, would appreciate it if you did. Uh, let me ask you, Dr. Halverson, in your testimony, you described the Community Facilities Program as a successful model 
for public-private partnerships. Could you tell us, is there anything that we in Congress can do to help you improve this program? Well, this is a program that we think has proved highly successful over time uh, uh, on its face. It also is successful not just for the individual investments that have been made, uh, but also because it mobilizes and catalyzes additional capital to communities that need it. So not just capital from CoBank and or the farm credit system, but from community banks, local banks, and state and local authorities. Uh, and our request to the committee to help us uh, do this is to speak with our, uh, with our regulator. We have a approval process now that I would describe as administratively burdensome and, you know, one at a time uh, approvals. We would like to see that become a, a, an institutionalized uh, programmatic approval process so that the business can be uh, executed in a more sustainable and viable manner because we think there's ample opportunities for us to do this in rural America and we'd like to do it in a more scaled way than we currently can. <clears throat> Thank you. Gentleman yells back. Uh, Mr. Rick Crawford. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Halverson, the President has indicated that private dollars can be leveraged uh, with public funds to repair crumbling infrastructure. In your view, is private finance such as CoBank prepared to meet that demand? We absolutely are. Uh, as I said in my verbal testimony and written testimony, you know, CoBank and the farm credit system cannot meet every demand for every project in every place in America. We have decades of experience, however, of leveraging uh, private sector capital, working closely with uh, commercial banks in particular, uh, and uh, USDA and others to do precisely that. Uh, what's happening and in, in, in changing, particularly around communications infrastructure, is technology is changing, the demand for uh, capital to deal with these issues uh, is growing. Uh, we have a great uh, track record, we believe, of, of, of doing the right thing to uh, meet the needs, uh, and we'd like to continue to do more of it and make a substantial contribution along with all of the other sources of capital that include uh, commercial banks, other private sources, as well as uh, state and local governments uh, where appropriate, and the Department of Agriculture. So, you know, CoBank has a history of these kinds of partnerships. Um, financing through partnerships with local banks, as you mentioned, with the rural, utilities, rural Utility Service. Why do you think others have been sort of shying away from that type of partnership? Well, I, I want to give credit where, where it's due, right? There are thousands of community banks across the country who, who do a lot to provide for the needs of their, of their local communities and uh, regional banks as well. But as you've heard in Ms. Atwell's testimony and, uh, and other members of the panel here this morning, it's nothing new. Uh, and the economies of scale problem. There aren't that many people in rural America, so the revenue stream that's possible upon which to make investments and build businesses is much more challenging where population densities is, are as low as they are uh, in rural America. And in its wisdom, the Congress established the farm credit system 101 years ago, and you know our, our mission is to meet that fundamental issue and do as much as we possibly can uh, to meet the needs of agriculture and in the last several decades, infrastructure investment. And we, we intend to continue to do that and broaden and deepen our, our partnerships uh, with, with other capital providers to meet these uh, very substantial needs that you're hearing about this morning. Um, Ms. Otwell, in your testimony, you talked about uh, the important distinction between assistance and raising capital for construction and assistance in funding the ongoing costs of a servicing system. So it's kind of like buying the horse and feeding the horse. Exactly. Uh, the initial investment is one thing, but the upkeep is another. You, can you talk about that? Why is it not enough to just simply provide uh, cheaper financing to rural systems? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. It does. It takes both. So the initial loan from either public sources or private sources is what helps us put the infrastructure in the ground. But as I talked about in my testimony, with only 3.4 customers per square mile, that's simply not enough customers to, to provide for the ongoing costs of operating that network, making the loan repayments, et cetera. So we really do need that predictable, sustainable support to make the business case for the loans in the first place and the investment in the first place. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with you on this one, too. The, um, if you would kind of explain some of the effects of the shortfalls of the USF, um, the, the, how that's affecting you and other companies like you and, and rural con uh, communities that you serve. Sure. Just like I, when I was talking to Mr. Peterson, um, we, we have some actual numbers for the shortfalls. For the model side, it's 70,000 rural Americans will get lesser service, 
50,000 may get none. For my company alone, it's 551 customers over the next 10 years. And if you're one of those customers, you're likely in some of the highest cost areas that we serve, which means you likely don't have another option. So that is definitely a detriment to rural companies. Companies are having to slow down their investments. When we're making long-term investments like this, any sort of unpredictability uh, definitely is hard to make those long-term investments on. Um, re workforces are reducing in some cases, and so it's really bad for rural consumers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman yields back. Ms. Adams for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Peterson, and thank you to all, of you with all the witnesses who have testified today, and particularly to you, Mr. Wynn. Thank you for coming in from North Carolina. Uh, ensuring that we have sound and, and flourishing uh, rural infrastructure is essential to addressing disparities in, in economic opportunity. Uh, the state of our rural infrastructure affects food, and food security, education quality, access to necessities like broadband, clean water, and many other important issues that North Carolina and states across America face. Uh, so hopefully the committee won't lose sight of what constitutes a rule in terms of my district and many others uh, across the country. Um, so also um, looking forward, we, we must ensure that, our, that any potential infrastructure package uh, addresses the concerns of, of our rural areas, land grant universities, particularly the 1890s, and our most vulnerable Americans. Uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, let me begin with you and ask, uh, in your testimony you mentioned that in today's world of video conferencing and online education, telemedicine connectivity is not a luxury, it is a necessity. I agree with you. Broadband um, uh, internet helps uh, close educational divides. It provides access to quality health care and crucial work support. But unfortunately, many North Carolinians still don't have access to reliable internet service. So could you talk a little bit about what types of tools that you believe electric uh, cooperatives uh, should have um, uh, access to in order to help bridge this digital divide in, uh, between the haves and the have-nots? Yes, thank you, Ms. Adams. And, uh, as some of the colleagues here on, on at, at the table have been already saying that it is a challenge and it is a um, necessity to have those things as rural citizens. And we hear it clearly from our members who know that rural electric cooperatives have brought electricity to rural areas when no one else would. And we're hearing that same, that same theme as we realize that, that broadband and telecommunications is necessary. So some of the tools that um, are necessary, of course, obviously funding is, is, a, is a major need. Uh, but I think that we have an opportunity that we're seeing in, in, at our cooperative as we try to address this and, and the ability to leverage um, what we already have. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we're, we have started building infrastructure for the, for the purpose of providing better service for being more cost effective from a utility standpoint. Um, but as we build this infrastructure and start looking at the possibility of, of leveraging that infrastructure to bring broadband, um, doing it in a way that is closely connected and tied in with our, our, our current business structure is one that makes a lot of, it, it provides somewhat of a, of a promising opportunity for us because of a lot of the investment is already being made on the utility side of the business and to leverage that investment to bring broadband is, is in many ways making the numbers look a lot better. Um, so I think that the tools may, some of them have already been mentioned as far as looking at the Universal Service Fund, as, as far as looking at RUS financing. Those tools are great, but many of our, my colleagues across the country are still finding it very hard to make the numbers work because of the sparseness of, of our populations. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kuhn, um, uh, it's good to have you here representing APLU. Um, last month, the committee heard testimony from Dr. Walter Hill from Tuskegee, uh, who in his testimony um, talked about the estimating land grants deferred maintenance. Tuskegee has, alone has about 43 million. Uh, my alma mater, North Carolina A&T, um, has as part of its cost uh, an $8 billion. What infrastructure priorities would you recommend uh, to ensure that 1890s and all land grant universities are prepared to take on the important agricultural research of the 21st century? 
Well, I, I think one, one of the great opportunities here is for, for the, the, the committee uh, through policy, but then also in, in the uh, administration of that through the USDA to identify those priorities. So, for example, what our, our uh, sister institution Langston has a very strong program in goat research and, and delivering that information to, to goat producers not only in Oklahoma but far beyond. Or the I know the small farmer program at North Carolina A&T are very strong programs. So um, we, we talked about that. Dr. Hill was on the, the committee that I was, was a part of and we talked about having sort of a, a, a several tiers to a, a grants program for infrastructure so that uh, you can set the, the priorities uh, as they're needed to support those kinds of programs, uh, but also that the, uh, uh, that, that, that the level of funding is, uh, is tiered as well. So if there's a need for a million dollars to help with a facility, that that's not in some way competing with another program that, that another university requires $30 million for. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Mr. General Chair, General you're back. Mr. Davis for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I find it ironic that out of all the microphones that don't work today, it happens to be mine. Was there some type of conspiracy from many of our colleagues? No, it's not a conspiracy. It's a flat out. <laughs> <laughs> Completely on purpose. Let the record show. But now what's wonderful is I have two microphones, so I'm in stereo and even louder. Hey, uh, first off, thank you to the witnesses. Um, I want to start my questioning with Mr. Calhoun. I'm about to go over to another hearing uh, for another committee that I serve on, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, to talk about the importance of our locks and dams and our inland waterway navigation system. And I'd like to get your opinion on a, a few of the issues that you mentioned in your opening testimony in regards to that inland waterway system. As you know, Mr. Calhoun, uh, there are a lot of my farmers that rely upon uh, their grain being able to be shipped via barge uh, on the Illinois and, and Mississippi rivers in and around the areas that I serve in in central Illinois, but we saw the Obama administration zero out dollars for those projects in the, the line item that we call NEST. Um, can you give us a, a brief synopsis of why it's important for our agricultural sector, not just in the Midwest, but nationwide, to have access to that inland waterway system and why it's crucial to invest more dollars into it? Uh, the two, thanks, Congressman. Uh, the two words that I always come back to are competition and capacity. Mm -hmm. and, and without the waterways, the, the nation's going to lack capacity to get the, our, our, your farm products to market. And when you don't have enough capacity, prices go up or down. They go up. And uh, the price of transportation goes up. The price of grain then goes down. And likewise, you know, when you want to have competition, you want to have different modes. You need the access to the waterways. And, and competition is a great thing when it comes to American business. So those are the two words that I focus on. Um, the projects in, in your neck of the woods are very important. They're very important. I, I had a previous life. I worked for Cargill for 41 years. Uh, they're very important to all the members of the National Green and Feed Association. They're important to all farmers because the, the river prices every bushel of grain that's produced in this country, not just the ones that are grown around the river. So when the prices along the river decline, the prices all over the nation are going to decline. And so it's, it's very, very critical that we, the, some of these locks and dams are, are older than I am, and I'm old. And, and uh, they, they need to be replaced and they need to be revitalized because if we have a catastrophic failure, it will cost this country billions of dollars if you shut down one of these segments for extended periods of time. And I don't think this nation can afford to do that. So I, I know you're on the TNI committee and I, I, I wish you great luck over there. Uh, we're very excited about what the president's come out and he's paying attention to infrastructure, but the, the trillion dollar question always is who's gonna pay for it and, and how's it equitably to be done? Right, thank you very much for your response. Uh, Dr. Kuhn, um, I thank you for being here. As, as somebody who represents a land grant institution in central Illinois, the University of Illinois, I'm always thankful that uh, anyone from Oklahoma State continues to sport the U of I colors every time you come <laughs> in. I notice that Chairman Lucas does the same on a regular basis, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but in all seriousness, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about ag research. Um, it's been dwindling. I mean, we haven't grown it at the rate that other research dollars and other agencies have grown. Now, as we move forward, I, I only have a little bit of time left. So if you could, if you could, and on behalf of all the land grant institutions and especially the one I represent, can you kind of talk about some of the regulatory hurdles that you face in accessing those ag research dollars right now? 
and what we can do to act, what we can do to relieve them in the future. You bet. Thanks for the question, Congressman. And, and uh, first of all, there's no blue. This is all black. But uh, that orange. Yeah, I, well, that's, that's half of the Illinois colors. <laughs> Congressman Lucas just showed up. I had to cover that. So, uh, the uh, um, seriously, you, you, with you, with respect to the the regulatory hurdles, you know, any kind of public investment is going to come with some uh, level of accountability, and and we understand and we appreciate that. We want to be accountable, but but sometimes the accountability ends up. It consuming more of our time, perhaps, than the actual doing of the research. And if we could find a way to get to a point of simply saying, um, did we do what we said we would do? Uh, did we spend money re responsibly to accomplish it? And did what we accomplish make a difference? Or do we have a reasonable expectation that it will make a difference? If we can get back to sort of those sorts of principles, it might help. Certainly in animal handling and, and well-being, it's important that we, we are good stewards of the animals that we work with. Um, pretty high uh, uh, levels of, of accountability there as well. It sometimes uh, uh, puts us in, in kind of a quandary of, well, are we going to invest in that or are we going to actually get some, some research done with, with uh, the facilities? So. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was time expired. Uh, Ms. Plaskett for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Uh, this is, of course, I think one of the primary um, subject matters that we here in ag uh, need to be discussing. I was, you know, very grateful. I had yesterday a meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture and talked with him about the President's infrastructure um, proposal and the need to really have uh, concretely in there issues relevant to the rural area. Um, Mr. Halverson, you mentioned in your uh, testimony innovative public-private partnerships and the role that they play in helping to meet financial needs for infrastructure projects. That's a particular area that's very important to me. <clears throat> Before coming to Congress when I had a real life, uh, I was an attorney doing public finance law. So public pro Public-private partnerships are something that I think are very important and instrumental. Um, one of the concerns I have with regard to public-private partnerships is how do we incentivize developers and others to come to rural areas to engage in those projects? And how do we incentivize uh, developers to come into areas where there is not going to be the amount of public, local public funding to support that. Um, for example, in the Virgin Islands, where, which I represent, we face enormous uh, financial issues, a financial crisis and strains. And so what are the ways that you think um, that we can deploy funding into rural areas that have those limited local resources? And well, have you seen that? And what are examples of that that you can cite for us? Well, thank you, Representative Plaskett, for the question. I think uh, the facts and circumstances in the local area are going to be very determinative in, uh, in, in what is possible, right? Whether you're in a, a place with, you know, one person per square mile or 50 persons per square mile and, and so forth is going to make a big difference. Uh, the, the level of, of uh, capital uh, requirement and the type of uh, business that we're talking about. Uh, that's a long way of saying it depends on what the facts and circumstances are and the location that you're that you're looking at, and there isn't a one size fits all answer. Uh, you can look at them on a, on a continuum, and on, on one end of the continuum, you need a higher amount of uh, public funding, universal service funds, and other forms to help drive down the the, the drive down the costs. Yep. Uh, but you always look for the ability to attract uh, institutions like CoBank and our partners in, in the farm credit system who are providers of, of uh, reasonably priced uh, uh, capital in, in, in loan form. Uh, and there are, in fact, a, a great array of, of uh, private companies already that are in the uh, infrastructure business, whether it's communications or, or otherwise. And, we bank a lot of those companies, and they're always looking for new places to go to continue to grow their businesses, and we try to support them in, a, in whatever way is, uh, is appropriate. If you have a particular situation you'd like us to look at, we'd be, we'd be happy to do so. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Ms. Otwell, a question for you. Um, in the Agriculture Appropriations Bill, <clears throat> they recently reported out to the full, of the full committee um, report language directing USDA <laughs> excuse me, the FCC and the Commerce Department to prepare a report that details each agency's area of responsibility for addressing data speed. 
Um, you know, we talk about building infrastructure. We talk about the role of um, broadband in that infrastructure for rural areas. One of the things that we find very troublesome is the data speed uh, and the lack thereof in rural areas. And this becoming a divide for our farmers and for these communities in rural areas. Do you believe that it's agriculture department's area of responsibility to address this? And if so, how? Um, and how does the um, Department of Agriculture and this committee work to create any broadband infrastructure investment plans in this area? Thank you, Congresswoman. That's a very good question. Uh, we do have issues with speeds in rural areas sometimes. That's what we talk about when we are trying to build future-proof networks. Uh, when we're putting fiber in the ground, that's only limited by the electronics on either end. Mm -hmm. And so when we try to build networks, that's part of what we are trying to put in the best possible infrastructure to be ready for the future. Some of what the FCC still deems as broadband is really not fast enough to do all these applications that we talk about. Uh, one thing we do want to think about is with limited resources available from whatever possible way. We don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Um, the FCC oversees that universal service fund that has been revamped. It's ready to go. It just doesn't quite have enough funding in it right now. So we're always interested to hear other opportunities, um, things like that, but we, but we want to be careful not to, to reinvent processes and not be efficient in that way. Um, we also don't want to overbuild networks where they do already exist and waste money that way either. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Jill Hayes, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Rick Allen, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we are, um, I guess, going to talk about broadband here and, and the critical uh, application of that service. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, agriculture, uh, from a technology standpoint, is, it has advanced very rapidly. And uh, I will say that I, uh, I uh, planted some uh, peanuts, and uh, first time I've ever done that and not touched the wheel of the tractor. And I planted them like 17 inches over from the year before. And so uh, it's pretty amazing uh, what we're able to do in agriculture today. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, we've got to do something about connecting, uh, you know, c connecting uh, our rural America, our farmers, and all those in agribusiness, uh, not only through the uh, various programs, but also education and, and things of that nature. Um, and we've got to have we got to have good service uh, because these folks are obviously uh, uh, very dependent on it. So, with that, uh, as far as uh, if you could share your organization's perspectives on the need to develop infrastructure that supports broadband in both wired and wireless formats, and in particular where access to high-speed mo high mobile services are currently lacking. Could you address the, the panel, uh, who, would, the, who on the panel would want to address how, how can we get where we need to get here? I would love to speak to that. Thank you, Congressman. Yes. Uh, we do see a lot of working together with, with wireless networks in our mm -hmm. area and some of our most remote areas, we do actually use a fixed wireless product to serve, especially some of those farms in those extremely remote areas. However, the thing to know about that is that even with a wireless network, those customers don't know which one they're on. They don't care. They're still generating huge amounts of data. You've talked about some of the smart farming initiatives. Um, people are using video streaming, some of the educational things, telehealth applications. That's generating huge amounts of data. And any wireless network cannot handle that amount of data except over a very short distance. So you still have to have that wired network in place to the tower to be able to offload that data. In our area, we also have some national cellular carriers that, are, that have towers in our area, and we have built fiber to those towers because they face the same problem. It's still a huge amount of data that has to meet the rest of the world somewhere. Is, is this like a density issue? In other words, uh, cost per uh, user uh, situation to pay for this amount of data that, that, that is needed? It is. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you're in a rural area or not. We're still using massive amounts of data, and certain networks just can't handle that yet. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, Congressman, I, I think the same issues that the farmers and other people that you mentioned are having, so are utilities, electric cooperatives, okay. because our, the way we operate as a business now has changed tremendously over time. Mm -hmm. um, we have to have smarter devices downstream on the lines, which really require broadband infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Anything we do now has to almost be connected some way and have some, some level of communication. So 
One solution that we're looking at is, is as we build our infrastructure as the electric cooperative, the members who are, who are being served by us are also reaping the benefits of that. So mm -hmm. that leveraging is, is, is another possibility that we're toying around with. The utility, the cooperative is having to do this. It's almost not an option as it once was in the past. So there may be some opportunities. Right. Well, we've got private companies implementing uh, broadband service, right? or, or co-ops in private companies right now. And uh, you know, my concern is how, you know, we, we've had this tremendous lag from getting service to, to user as we get more dispersed into the less popular areas of the, of the country. And of course, I think that's a, a, a financial matter. Uh, so, and, and of course, it sounds like it's also a data requirement matter. In other words, uh, our farmers and folks like that need tremendous access to data for their, uh, and I, I guess is it the same in the electric co-ops as well? It's, it's pretty complex. A absolutely. Um, data is becoming the thing that we really have to have to operate, and it's really driven by the demands of our members or consumers. What they expect today is totally different from before, and data is, is definitely in in the mix of being necessary. Right. Well, of course, in my district, agriculture is number one industry. And uh, in my state of Georgia, agriculture is the number one industry. And, uh, you know, I don't quite understand why we can't uh, serve that industry the way we need to serve that industry with, uh, uh, with these technical services. And obviously, electric co-ops are a big part of my, my district as well. So. Thank you for your, uh, for your testimony, and uh, Ms. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Jim, it's time expired. Mr. Panetta for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses who are here, your preparation, your time, as well as your testimony. I appreciate you coming in, and I apologize for having to step out that I did, uh, but I'm back, and now you get to hear from me a little bit. Uh, I hail from the central coast of California, what many of my members here know as the salad bowl of the world. Uh, we have a number of specialty crops. Uh, specialty crops take a lot of labor to produce. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lack of labor right now, and that's an issue. And there's obviously two ways to deal with that. One is here in Congress with proper immigration reform, but two is mechanization uh, in dealing with the lack of labor. Uh, one of the valleys I have, the Salinas Valley, uh, right now is obviously a big in specialty crops. There's a number of other valleys, but one of the other valleys that is paying particular interest to the Salinas Valley is Silicon Valley because they are seeing that that's kind of a way to go in regards to where their investment can go. And that's happening. We're seeing a lot of ag tech innovation. Um, and they're very excited about it, let me tell you. They're very excited about coming up with ways to help the farmers out to fill that lack of labor. But uh, my question to you is, and what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is that without proper broadband, the mechanization uh, will not be implemented uh, and they're, they're, it will inhibit innovation when it comes to mechanization. And so I was wondering if uh, any of the witnesses could testify to that fact as to how it does inhibit innovation, how it could prevent actual implementation of mechanization in our agriculture. Well, I'll take a, uh, a, a take a, a stab at that, Congressman Panetta. I have had the opportunity to be out in your in your area, and we have some very important farm credit partners who lend to farmers and ranchers in your district and all over uh, the state of California. And, but but I hear that exact same thing all over the country, right? I go out and I, I visit uh, a farmer producers all over the place, and modern technology. Uh, which generates exponential growth in data, as my colleagues just indicated, is a substantial contributor to the dramatic increases in productivity in, in American agriculture over our lifetime. Uh, and there is no end in sight to the upside to our ability to continue to produce. We do have some significant constraints, however, in, in, in our ability to uh, realize the tremendous value that our agricultural productivity uh, uh, can uh, generate in, in the long run, right? One of them is the transportation infrastructure. The other is uh, communications, because uh, uh, if Congressman Allen were here, I'd tell him the same thing. You know, if you get into your combine or your tractor, you, sometimes you need a USB chip with a bunch of data in it, and you need wireless communications. Otherwise, you can't actually operate your technology. So to your point, it becomes a real impediment. 
many of the pieces of high technology equipment these days that, are, that, that, that people use, whether in specialty crops in particular, they get downloads of new software overnight. Their, their, their uh, difficulties get diagnosed remotely from the foreign country where the thing was produced or from somewhere else in the, in the country. Uh, and they, don't, they, they can't take it to a shop and there's not somebody for 500 miles to come and fix it. So it gets diagnosed uh, remotely. So what we're seeing is a dramatic conversion between the communications industry and the agricultural industry because they are so interdependent on each other. And our ability to continue to uh, uh, generate the kind of agricultural pro uh, productivity that we have, whether in base row crops or specialty crops, increasingly depends on our ability to, to deploy high quality, ubiquitous communications infrastructure. Exactly. Thank you. Any I, other witnesses? Yeah, Congressman, just a, a, a few other things. You know, in, so information really is key to success in, in agriculture today, and the faster the better. And so in Cooperative Extension, we find ourselves with a tremendous opportunity to deliver information and programs to, to producers very effectively using technology, but it doesn't get to them if they don't have the bandwidth. Right, so that's, that's one of the challenges. But, uh, and likewise, we have a, a, a meteorological network within Oklahoma that we provide, uh, along with the University of Oklahoma. And again, it's extremely valuable information for producers in determining when it's best to spray or burn or whatever, but they've got to be able to get that data. So it's really key. One of our ag econ uh, faculty members is conducting a study currently. It's USDA funded. Uh, Dr. Brian Whitaker is looking at, so, if you, if you make it available, how do people use information when it becomes available in a rural setting? And so he's going out and putting it, basically creating hotspots in uh, rural communities and then studying the behavior of people as they, use as they use that to get information. What are they using it for? Where are they going? And so on. Right. Finally, I think rural health is, is also tied in with this. And our, our uh, dean for our Center of Health Sciences, uh, Dr. Casey Shrum, uh, is, is de developing a network to provide uh, telemedicine in, in effect in rural communities. Again, we've got to have that bandwidth. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Denham, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, holding a hearing on this important topic. Uh, this is uh, an area I focus a lot on, on natural resources and transportation infrastructure as well. I introduced uh, the new Water Act because in our area, agriculture does not survive without having not only proper conveyance, but uh, equally important, if not more important, proper storage. And um, I thought it was important to make sure that we had a program where we could borrow money uh, where users would pay that, that uh, upfront funding back by, as a water user, I'd pay for my water and that would go to uh, paying back the infrastructure. Our challenge is, uh, like WIFIA and TIFIA, uh, we need another uh, type of funding for Bureau of Reclamation Districts, districts. so the new Water Act would deal with RIFIA. Mr. McManus, I wonder if you could tell us uh, a little bit about um, some of the work that has been done with WIFIA and whether or not uh, you see uh, other benefits to storage uh, across the country. Congressman, thank you for your question. I, I was beginning to feel a little neglected up here. <laughs> but uh, our, our focus in, in the water industry is on potable water predominantly. We, we do not focus on the irrigation and delivery and conveyance for crop production. Uh, but we, we deliver predominantly to people's homes, businesses, and commercial facilities, processing facilities, but not irrigation water. So we, we're, not, we're not familiar intimately with that program. But you've utilized WIFIA in the past. Uh, sir, I'm not familiar with that Advanced. program. No, okay. Uh, well, let me just a ask one step further. Uh, on the Clean Water Act, um, we end up with a lot of compliance issues. Uh, you had talked about this in your, your testimony. Um, what I've heard from some water users is that the compliance issue um, oftentimes is a hindrance to putting new projects in place because they're concerned about whether or not, uh, as they've implemented new projects, whether or not they can actually achieve the compliance um, and end up pay facing penalties that they would not have faced previously. Yes, sir. The, the, pro the example I gave in my testimony, the UV disinfection system, we, we sampled our raw water the first time in 2010, and when our samples came up positive for the cryptosporidium, we had to start a process of implementation to get this infrastructure built to have a treatment technique that would deal with these log removals that the EPA requires. Um, 
I think my concern with, with the regulation itself is no matter how the results on our raw water turn out again in the future, if the cryptosporidium is no longer there, the EPA still mandates that I provide the treatment continuously whether or not the cryptosporidium is even present anymore. So a lot of the regulations that we deal with don't necessarily have a real world practical application. The other side of the story is we've been treating the same raw water from the Rio Grande River in our treatment facility with conventional uh, coagulation, sedimentation, and filtration for 30 years, have never had a waterborne disease illness outbreak, and now that we've started testing for cryptosporidium, I have to add an additional one and a half million dollars of infrastructure to treat an organism that we haven't really had an issue with. So do the regulations always make sense? No, sir, I, I can't say that they do on the investment that we have to, to make in that regard. Um, I think EPA is always going to side on the error of, of safety when it comes to public health. And, and their drive on this whole issue on the cryptosporidium goes back to Milwaukee when you had a massive release of manure into the, to the uh, receiving stream or the, or the raw water source for the city of Milwaukee, and they had a massive waterborne disease outbreak. We're not looking at the same circumstances by any means, um, but we're still having to comply with those strict issues. And I'll give you another you. example I, of the I, EPA. I, my time is short. And I've got one more question. But I do agree that uh, we've seen a lot of projects that have been hindered just because of the compliance and the and the uh, fees associated with it. My, my final question, Mr. Calhoun, on the, uh, on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we talk a lot about the inland waterways and the uh, conveyance of a lot of our products that move interstate commerce through our waterways. Uh, we have a 29 cent tax, uh, fuel tax, uh, that goes to the uh, Inland Waterways Trust, uh, which is also matched by public funds. It is a great way to make sure that those waterways stay open. Um, but we always see uh, new efforts to put uh, new fees, tollways, locks and dams um, that could, inter uh, could interfere with that interstate commerce. Uh, I wonder if you could briefly uh, discuss that. Certainly. I, thanks, Congressman. I, I commented in my testimony about the, our objection to uh, tolls and fees. There's, there's, there's the difference between the waterways and a toll road, first of all. If, if you build a new toll road, uh, you still have the state highway you could drive on and go around it. You have other alternatives than paying these, these high price fees, and, and, uh, and we don't see that with, on the waterways. You have one way to go, and it's, it's through the locks and dams. And we feel very strongly that, that you're, you're going to penalize the users of the system, in this case, the American farmer, because if you have a 25 cent, 50 cent, 75 cent charge, that will have to be passed through to either the ultimate consumer or the person who produced the product. So that, that, that cost is going to go someplace. Thank you. I'm out of time, but if I could uh, ask you to respond in writing, um, if you could elaborate on the other beneficiaries that uh, may also have a stake in the inland waterway system and uh, making sure that it works properly. We're looking at those other beneficiaries that might also uh, not be able to be helpful. Jim and Tommy Spart, Ms. Blunt Rochester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, many people don't realize that uh, Delaware, they, they might drive to our beautiful beaches, but don't recognize the diversity of our state. Um, we have a very strong agriculture community. And so I want to first thank the chairman and the ranking member for this panel. I mean, speaking of diversity, it's a very diverse issues as well. Um, we uh, really, I want to address my first question to Mr. Kuhn, and I'm on the um, Biotech Forestry and Research Subcommittee, and so it kind of dovetails with Ms. Adams' question and also Mr. Davis's question. Um, as we know, there are many benefits of research conducted at public universities, including the fact that the information gathered is publicly available and transferable. Um, the academic setting allows for more long-term uh, goals and research, and we can look forward. And it's not constrained by the profitability goals uh, of uh, private research. So, um, and, and also, as our country uh, ramps up and, and uh, you know, tries to make sure that our investments are there, it helps us to be competitive. So uh, I'm fortunate to have two land-grant institutions in my state, the University of Delaware, which is my uh, alma mater, and also Delaware State University, both doing really great research uh, in the areas that are important to this committee and supported by federal funds. But how you talked about the fact that uh, basically you've got to deal with faculty lines over facility lines. And my question is, how does deferring maintenance over time increase the likelihood 
of agricultural research being dominated by private research? And what kind of research may we lose out on uh, because of this shifting dynamic? Well, thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate the question, your, your thoughtful uh, considerations there. I, you know, I think uh, in, in, in part uh, the, the, the risk of, of everything becoming privatized, uh, it's real. Uh, and at the same time right now, I think we have a, a healthy balance in that a lot of the fundamental research that is important for agriculture, it still is being done primarily at the public universities. It has been that way, still is that way. And where the private sector takes over is in the application of that, developing varieties using technology that was originally developed at the universities. I think that's a good balance. And, and the risk is if the, if the uh, support for the fundamental research goes away, what will happen to the private interests that have depended on that in the past? Will they pick that up? There's, there's a lot of risk with it. A lot of things don't turn out, and, uh, and, and so the payoff isn't quite the same. So I think we, we run the risk of, of losing our overall capacity if it, if it all becomes in the private sector. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, the, the private sector tends to focus on the larger commodities, the more profitable areas, and so on. So specialty crops tend to not get as much attention, um, and, uh, and, and some of the other local uh, issues uh, don't get the attention that they might otherwise. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question for Mr. Wynn. It might not be quick, but I have a question for you. You mentioned micro microgrids. Um, can you talk about why these are an important infrastructure investment and also um, if there's potential for them to help alleviate the maintenance costs of having to wire our most rural areas? I think the, the, they are important because of the diversity of our system and how it's evolving and the demands of our, our consumers. Having a microgrid also provides more resiliency when there are outages and, and, and electricity is becoming more and more critical and the loss of it is becoming more and more of, uh, of an issue when it's not there. So microgrids pr provide another opportunity to make sure that our systems are more resilient. We're kind of going back to where, from where we come because in the beginning that's what we really had was microgrids and we got larger and became more centralized. So I think that's important. Um, so th the second part of your question was... And, and do you think it would help alleviate the, the maintenance of having to um, wire? Uh, there, there are situations even with our system where we're looking at the possibility of microgrids, especially in rural areas where you in some cases have miles and miles of line to get to a, a load that's centralized, that, that is much far, very far away from the centralization. So there are going to be opportunities, yes, that I think microgrids will make a lot of sense financially. Great. And I only have like 10 more seconds, and I wanted to ask Ms. Otwell a really quick question. You mentioned about sending inf information to the FCC um, on the geocoded maps. Is there a map uh, of the country, I've heard yes and no, that shows how we look from a broadband perspective? I don't think there's an accurate one right now. How about that? Thank you. Your <laughs> lady's time expired. Uh, Mr. Dunn, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Kuhn, <coughs> Dr. Kuhn, uh, in recent months, a proposal to cap the indirect costs of certain federal grants, research grants, uh, has been floated. Uh, today, fortunately, uh, in the Appropriates Committee, they're marking up a bill that would prohibit those caps on NIH grants and, and um, USDA grants. Would you discuss the impact those caps have on your research? Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate the question, and, and thank you also for all who had a part in, in protecting uh, us from, from that, uh, that change. Uh, that, uh, we, we call them facilities and administration costs. Uh, they are real. If, if we're doing research in a building that was built for, for classes, uh, that's great, but, that, but that the research that's going on in there wasn't necessarily included in, in that original construction. So we really have to recognize that the mission of the university going into research is beyond what it was created for or what, what our, our, our state funding often is for. So we really need to find a way to, uh, to, to pay for the actual cost of the utilities that go into the research and so on. So I, I'm going to suggest yeah. that you just keep pounding on everybody that, that the cost of overhead is how you do business. I mean, your business is research. Absolutely. And, you know, your overhead is not going to go away. It's real. 
Yeah, Israel. And so thank you very much thank for that. You. We're going to keep you, keep you in mind. Uh, Ms. Otwell, uh, I, I so like the last question on the mapping because that's the complaint that I, I hear about. The, the maps aren't real. We we'll hear that there is broadband and there isn't, or there isn't broadband and there is. And so I would, I'm just going to ask, if, submit to you that I think that it's, we need some better maps. And I have the internet page that looks like it reveals that information, but comment. And I think that's why some of our reforms have changed to give a better view of what is exactly out there to each and every location. So I think that's, that's definitely the reason why some of those have changed. Yeah, and, I, and I, I like, in general, I think it's a bad idea for the government to be competing against private enterprise, you know, in these spaces. However, Mr. Scott made a good point. Just because you, you have a provider and service in there doesn't mean it's, it's good service. Uh, so in, in the two minutes or so left to us, I'd like you and I to speculate on which technology or technologies are actually ultimately going to deliver the broadband to all the rural and remote areas in our country, whether the Virgin Islands or in the second district of, uh, of Florida, which is a very agrarian and a lot of areas that are underserved. Um, so this is part cost benefit analysis and it's part sort of science techie analysis. I also sit on the science committee. We think we have some insights to share with you over there on that. Please speculate. Um, you're right, there are definitely some varying options for different technologies. However, I would once again restate that a lot of those futuristic technologies, some of your satellite and wireless and whatnot, those cannot handle the amount of data currently that we are looking at. In my company alone, our average usage for our users at night has gone up more than 750% over the last five years. And that's not slowing down. It grows exponentially by the day. And so right now, the only technology that can handle that much data is a fiber network. Some of these other options are great for that last little bit to reach the customer. I had mentioned that we also use some fixed wireless in some of our higher cost areas. It is a better benefit ratio. But there comes a point where you have to have that wired network to complement and all of those other options. They really are complementary networks. So I actually sat with you know, some of the very, very large ISP providers. Uh, don't need to name them, you know who they are. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're hesitant to, to build out that as it's the cost benefit analysis. They just don't see the, that they're ever going to get that investment back on, on fiber or wire or beamed broadband. But they, they do think that they've got it, the solution in hand with satellites. There are new satellites, new CubeSats, constellations of CubeSats that they're, they've already rented the launch times in Florida to put these things up. I think that that's what you're gonna see is gonna be the... The other thing I would say about satellite technology, especially in these rural areas, sometimes our network is the only voice network. And that is still extremely important for public safety purposes, things like that. And with satellites, you do have issues with weather. Um, sometimes they have uh, latency issues. And so we do wanna keep that in mind too, that there are other things that these networks are used for that maybe some of that technology is just not quite there and can, and can provide just yet. All right, well, thank you very much. I uh, thank all the panel. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back his time, thank you. Mr. Uh, O'Holloran. Tom, I'm gonna to figure out how to say your name one of these days. We'll, we'll talk about it, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I, um, getting back to cost-benefit analysis, I guess I wasn't gonna go in that direction initially, but I, I think it's the right direction to go in. Uh, we have these urban centers all around the world, but in, in America especially, uh, and then we have rural areas. And they're interdependent on one another. There, there's just no doubt that, that both the urban centers uh, need that electrical grid. They need the water. They need the, the natural resources that come out of these rural areas. They need the food. Uh, uh, and, and the rural areas need the telemedicine. They need the quality of life issues. Uh, the urban areas need, on the weekend, this coming weekend, will be flocking out of Washington to get to those rural areas to relax and enjoy, and hopefully have decent broadband. Uh, but the, the core issue here is, is uh, that the, there is a cost-benefit analysis on that side of the equation. Uh, the idea that, that, uh, that this interdependency is only a one-way street, that you know, we have to look at these urban centers with uh, large populations in order to make sure that we have a uh, benefit from the cost standpoint, when it's a shared environment. And we must find a way to, to be able to identify that. So what I'm asking is, 
Does anybody up there know of any type of studies that have been done to uh, clearly identify this cost benefit of the, the urban environment coming out to us and our environment coming into urban uh, all the time and that this is a crucial area for us to invest in as a country and that urban people get as much out of it as we do in rural Arizona. Anybody? I would be happy to speak to that. I don't have it in front of me. I would be more than happy to send to you afterwards. Last year, the Hudson Institute did a study in combination with the Foundation for Rural Service that showed just rural broadband infrastructure contributed $24 billion to the nation's economy as a whole, and that two-thirds of that actually benefited urban Americans, with only one-third of it benefiting rural Americans. And so just like you said, they need us, we need them. And so anything we can do, like providing adequate broadband in rural areas, everything we do to make rural areas more efficient saves money for urban Americans too. The price of milk, different commodities that come out of rural America, those efficiencies in turn help urban Americans save too. Miss, uh, well, I, I did read that and you did have that in here or somebody did. Uh, but the core issue to me is that we study the, uh, the, the, the economic development potential and the potential of, of the cost of rural area to rural areas of serving that population that's coming out. The, the, the cost to the children that live in rural areas by not having the education necessary. The cost benefit of, of rural areas being able to, instead of going out and competing for language teachers, doing it um, uh, uh, through telecommunications uh, or broadband, uh, <coughs> telemedicine through broadband, instead of having to have that specialist at the hospital. There's, there's these benefit analysis processes that must go on, I believe, in order for us to get a true picture and thereby be able to justify the investment in broadband uh, throughout our country. Because uh, my district, uh, when you take a look at Navajo at 60% at unemployment and White Mountain at 80% uh, unemployment, uh, these are critical issues, and rural America in general the unemployment rate is so high, much higher than in urban, urban settings. And so uh, we have to find a way to uh, balance this process in an appropriate way and get others to recognize the uh, need for more of a community approach to this than just, well, I have to run a line from point A to B and here's how much it costs and we can just can't do that. Um, it costs us all if, if the quality of life of people and our ability to get people to service the infrastructure of America is lost, and, and, and these towns and cities are lost. So uh, I open that up to anybody for his discussion in 34 seconds. What? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, yield. I, yield. I, I mean, the, the, the logic of that is very compelling, Congressman. The challenge, of course, is it's really, really hard to measure. Right. Uh, we, we recently produced a piece of uh, a piece of research to try to illuminate the differences between uh, the service provision and in various infrastructure segments in rural America versus urban America. And we found it challenging to get data to to uh, to demonstrate the case and to and to measure some of these things. What you tend to get is organizations who are, you know, focused uh, focused on a more micro level on their industry or their region or what have you. I don't, I, I'm unaware of anyone who's done this in the way you're describing, which is kind of on a national basis, to try and come up with some proxy for what's the value to urban America of everything they get in rural America and therefore that they ought to contribute in some way to paying for, uh, which is, I think we probably would all agree is worthy, but very, very hard to measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. Mr. Lamoff, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, well, uh, you mentioned, you know, that there's uh, federal proposals to accelerate the ability to do projects. And uh, examples I have, like in uh, Siskiyou County in the far north part of my NorCal district, you have delays from U.S. Forest Service, for example, in, uh, in starting the environmental reports because they're doing a lot of other things besides that. So it's like for one, one provider, their projects already cost them a full year and now initial, initial, additional delaying, taking it into next year. This happens a lot. You have a BLM, you know, where there's cross-jurisdiction perhaps. Again, Forest Service, California Department of Transportation. Then you have to deal with NEPA and historic preservation compliance. So 
And we're not talking like we're building a dam here. We're not building a four-lane freeway. We're running some wire, maybe in a lot of cases already down in perhaps an existing right-of-way or something that'll be buried and never seen again after we've made our initial footprint. So do you see that uh, some of the proposals being talked about to accelerate projects is, is uh, do you really, are they going to provide any true regulatory relief? Are they going to, uh, and do you have any recommendations that we could build off of those to uh, take it a little farther and be able to accelerate what people need in these areas? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. That's a very timely question. Uh, anything that can be done to streamline the many different processes, especially involving areas that deal with federal lands, would be helpful and free up resources to go back into deployment. For example, sometimes when you're dealing with those, you can have to file the same type of report and reviews across many different agencies. They all have their own timeline. They all have their own processes. So anything that can streamline that would definitely be a savings. It may be having a certain agency be a lead on that and kind of oversee the whole process. Another thing that happens sometimes are we have duplicative reports between state and federal levels. So sometimes if there's a way that the federal permit can use the state review uh, as, as being useful, then, then that helps too. Well, we are looking at some one-stop one shop, one shopping proposals. Do you see anything on the horizon already I might not be aware of that is being done administratively <laughs> or other legislation that uh, we, sh we should be aware of to get behind? There are a few things. I know there was a 2015 highway bill that involved some NEPA reviews, um, trying to consolidate those, but they were only for projects over $200 million, which is mm. quite a bit larger than most of our companies are doing. So sometimes even just making sure those thresholds are low enough to benefit the small companies as well would be very helpful. Yeah, a tiny threshold maybe would be good here because these seem like pretty low impact, low, low footprint uh, projects you're talking about. Uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, kind of a similar line with you here on this is that uh, you mentioned that reform priority, NEPA, ESA, and we're going to have a pretty good uh, look at ESA this week as well. So would significant reform help stretch the dollars uh, significantly further for infrastructure funding? Would uh, uh, do, you, do you see the, the dollars, you know, limited funds we have available, do you see these hangups being actually very costly? In, in getting them accomplished? Uh, yes, Congressman, I think they're costly in, in, in terms of lost opportunities um, that we otherwise would have if those were not there. So short answers, yes. Not necessarily the building of the infrastructure, but just blowing up the idea, people look at it and throw their hands up and say, in, in our world, yes, there are costs. And that has some of those regulations are really driving us towards <laughs> private sources of, of funding because of the overhead burden that's there, the, the need for engineers to come in and make do the inspections even after the fact. So we we think there are some real costs involved. That, that what would be one or two things you'd like us to get done in that area if we could? One, NEPA or what, what would it be? Well, really just recognizing the nature of our business. We are electric cooperatives that really don't have a, a, a profit motive at all, and we're, we're, self, we're governed by people we serve. So just the model itself really can alleviate some of the concerns that may be there that if we're not going to intentionally do something that would, that would hurt our neighbors, so if, if you would. So I think just really taking a new look at, at the motive behind some of the, the regulations in the beginning and, and realizing that the threat that might have been feared is not there any longer. Bring them back to the original mission. That's right. Okay. Hey, thank you, panelists, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Chairman Stavis expired. Uh, Ms. Luhan Grisham, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, thank you for this hearing today. Uh, Ms. Otwell, uh, the federal government has historically played a major role in the expansion of all major technology advances uh, in communications. So whether it's electricity or radio, the telephone, uh, federal government has certainly made these technologies ubiquitous throughout the country. And uh, while it feels a little bit awkward to say this, given that we've I've, I've been talking about broadband since it seems like uh, uh, laying fiber was uh, invented. And, uh, but it is clearly for rural America, it is the next frontier. And unless we get that done, we are not going to be able to support not only our rural communities, but I would submit that even in the ag, just that 
narrow, narrowing it completely, just the advances now in dairy farming, um, where quite literally we've got dairy cattle wearing pedometers uh, and uh, computer technology figuring out when these cows are ovulating, uh, and they're having a huge increase in the success rates of uh, fertilization uh, for their herds by using technology. Interestingly enough, where we've got some of the largest dairies in the country, uh, we can't access any of this technology in a routine and productive manner. And when we talk about innovations in ag communities, we know that most of these large ag enterprises uh, are, are, thank goodness, are in rural America and providing incredible economic footprints as well as feeding the world. But they can't take advantage of those innovations and the work that we invest in in other titles uh, in uh, the uh, Farm Bill unless we deal with broadband. And I know that my colleague, um, uh, Congressman Scott, I think he actually stole my question because I spent 30 years working in state government on and off, and the big issue about any technology investments through government was that the accountability aspects, we would be promised a product, we would be promised that this would happen in this way, uh, that would not occur, uh, we would spend billions of dollars, uh, and folks would feel a bit as if, if, if we're not understanding technology in the way that makes it reasonable for a lot of stakeholders or folks who are doing that contract work or competitive review or accountability, perhaps we shouldn't be investing anymore. And the problem is, of course, that is not the right, in, at least in my opinion, that gets you nowhere. So I know you started to talk about accountability. What, what could we do in addition that makes it very clear that getting broadband everywhere it needs to be should be a priority and should be in the Farm Bill, making sure that states like mine, where in the, uh, you heard them refer to the Navajo Nation, 90% of the Navajo Nation has no access to the internet, 90%. So we have to get that addressed, and they're a huge ag producer. What else can we be doing? Thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate the question. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, for the community-based rural carriers that serve some of those most rural areas, we have just undergone the reforms to address some of those sparsest areas. However, the funding is not there for the mechanism. We have actual numbers for how much it's unfunded. You can see the investments that rural uh, broadband deployers want to put in but simply can't because it's not there. So uh, those But I want to make that case for you. I agree with you. Yeah. So what would I tell my colleagues about making sure that the investments that we could put in to the Farm Bill would, would be carried out in the most effective, reasonable, and accountable manner, given that I would guess there's not a single member who hasn't felt like some stakeholder in a technology investment at government didn't exactly get what we thought we were gonna get and yet spent a ton of money. Any specific ideas that we could advocate for so that, I, because I feel like the Farm Bill is one of the most accountable efforts in terms of a private-public partnership to advance the issues that we think are a priority, including rural economic development. Do you, is there anything specific for you or anybody in the panel that we could uh, contemplate to create that balance and then maybe provide an incentive for more funding as a result? I think just pushing those that have worked on these mechanisms to fund them, that accountability is there, the targeted... Um, funds to build those targeted locations is there. So just, um, there was a letter that many of the committee members, committee members signed to the FCC earlier this year talking about that lack of funding and pressing them to, to put the funding there to, to put these reforms into action because it will build broadband. General, Thank you, I General, yield back. General Lady, time expired. Chairman Lucas, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kuhn, in your comments, uh, you noted that the land-grant universities, and I'm always uh, would be remiss if I don't remind everyone the miracle and the wonder of the Morrow Act of 1862 and the 1862 land grants and the 1890 land grants and the 1994 facilities. That opportunity for the first time truly in the history of the world for anyone with enough effort, enough energy, and some smarts to be able to secure a college education. Just an amazing thing, the land-grant universities. But you mentioned the $29 billion replacement value of the infrastructure of these facilities. 
and the $8 billion in deferred maintenance that we face now. Could you expand for a moment on what kind of things we're talking about that $8 billion would go to, and would you explain how that would help facilitate researchers, students, and the industries that, that utilize uh, all this uh, information that's developed? Well, thank you, Congressman. I, I appreciate your, uh, your loyalty to the land-grant system um, and, uh, and, and share in your uh, uh, respect for it. I, you know, I think <clears throat> where, where, where we find ourselves is we really need to, uh, uh, we, we need to look at ways of solving the problem without simply going out and saying we're going to spend $8.4 billion. Because uh, the, the kind of facilities, let me just use it as a, an ex example from Oklahoma State. Uh, we've got a dairy barn. It's a beautiful dairy barn built in the 40s uh, and uh, uh, go gorgeous design and so on. Our Holsteins don't fit in it. It was built for jerseys. Our jerseys would probably fit in it, but they wouldn't stay in it today if we tried to put them there. Uh, and, and it's a gorgeous wooden roof that has no protection or prevention for a fire. And so to go in and, and, and make that a usable facility, we'd spend millions of dollars to put sprinklers in and so on and so forth and, and, and end up with a substandard facility. So in cases like that, we're better off to do what we're doing, which is to build a new freestall barn at, at a lot lower cost uh, that's going to last for a long time. So some of it is simply replace it. But the rest of it is to, to as I said, to be more uh, diligent in ourselves in using our finances uh, to make sure that we're taking care of the facilities. And, and no one wants to spend money on that because it isn't glitzy and it, it doesn't get the attention of the public. But it, it's, you know, the bottom line is it's good stewardship, and that's what we need to take on. And those facilities enable the scientists who are also professors and teachers working with the undergraduate and graduate students to do their work. Expand on that for just a moment. Sometimes we forget that land grants are a hands-on experience. Absolutely. Well, and, and one of the, so, you know, what, one of the great risks that I fear is if we don't address this adequately, we're going to continue to lose our, our most valuable faculty, our, our greatest expertise, either to the private sector or, it, you know, it may be, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're stealing each other's best, perhaps from one university to another. But what that means is that we no longer have that expert on our campus teaching students either graduate students or undergraduates. In other words, uh, we're not creating the next generation of scientists. And so it's important to have the research done, but in the process of conducting that research, we're also building in the sustainability of this whole approach to agriculture that we created beginning in 1862, where research is what's driving innovation in agriculture. I was late this morning slightly because a number of us uh, from the Financial Services Committee have been down to the Federal Reserve Board his visit with the chair and the vice chair and one of the governors. And we got into a discussion about productivity and the decrease in the rate of productivity improvement in this country in the last 20 years. And the bottom line from their research department was essentially we weren't investing with the intensity we had in the previous decades or century and that this dramatic increase in productivity, which is how you increase people's standards of living, they produce more, you don't run faster, you work more efficient with more efficient processes, that we were entering a point where, through lack of investment, that rate of productivity was slowing in comparison to the rest of the world, and that if we were going to increase the standard of living, we had to enhance that, which I think tees off quite well in what you're describing about uh, continuing the mission. Because there will come a time, correct, as you just noted, where if we don't invest enough, and that infrastructure, both physical and intellectual, will go away and we'll never catch up once we're behind the curve. Well, it, as you know, we have, we have a fantastic wheat breeder, Dr. Brett Carver, who, who heads up our wheat improvement team. And, and uh, you know, he puts up with some really ugly facilities. He could facilities. work on any of four continents if he wanted to go somewhere. Yeah, he could. He could go anywhere in the world and, and, uh, and be paid a lot more than we're paying him. Don't let him know that I said that. But, but you know, the, the, the point is he'll probably stay with us. And I, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he's got great facilities. He'll probably stay with us. But who's going to follow him? How do we replace him if we don't have any better facilities than we have today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman's time expired. Mr. Cust Ms. Custer, five minutes. Thank you, thank you Chairman Conaway. Um, and thank you for this hearing on rural America. We appreciate it. Um, 
most of you have spoken about conditions that are very familiar to me in New Hampshire and rural uh, New England. And we've talked about all of these things in the four and a half years that I've been in Congress and, and made some good progress on red listed roads and bridges, replacing aging municipal water systems, modernizing our electrical grid and expanding broadband access to our rural communities. But I wanna focus in on the broadband because that's been um, of particular concern to uh, regions of my district. According to the FCC two, 2016 Broadband Progress Report, there are over 99,000 Granite Staters who live without access to fixed advanced telecommunications capability. And a lack of broadband infrastructure has had significant consequences for those rural regions of the state. Uh, when the rural markets go unserved, companies are less likely to relocate and invest in new jobs. Housing, housing prices are now depressed because of lack of access. Schools are burdened with costs and hospitals are less likely to use innovative telemedicine. So my question is for Jennifer Otwell. Uh, in your testimony, you refer to the importance of the Universal Service Fund and how it relates to federal loans and grants by small telecom providers. Can you explain why it's so important and what effects the current shortfalls in the budget are having on small telecom providers in rural communities? Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman. So the Universal Service Fund is what allows our company to make the business case to have those networks in the high cost rural areas in the first place. If we only have 3.4 customers per square mile, those customers themselves cannot pay enough or should not have to pay enough to make those networks feasible. So while we have programs like RUS and companies like CoBank and RTFC that provide the capital to make that initial investment, the loan programs that allow us to make those very uh, um, finance heavy investments, we really need that predictable, sustainable USF support to make the business case for it to be there in the first place. So uh, my question is what can we do in a bipartisan way and in particular do we need to change how the US USF collects fees and I'm concerned about what's going to happen to rural broadband deployment if the high cost budget doesn't change? You and me both, that's a very good question. There are proposals out there to start thinking about contributions and who is contributing to the fund. Um, those, are, those are very pressing questions that the FCC needs to work through and we need Congress to continue to press them to work through those issues. Thank you. Um, now this is a question for Curtis Wynn. Uh, can you share with us a bit what the increased adoption of distributed energy resources like wind or solar is doing in your system? Uh, I know you have community solar, and if you could talk about your investments for the future, um, uh, are you considering distributed energy in future investments? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, we are uh, in North Carolina really embracing, embracing this whole concept or movement, if you will, of, of distributed energy resources. Uh, we are investing, as you mentioned, in the, the community solar projects. There are several in the state where through, if you look at it from the standpoint of how it gets the availability of solar to every person who wants it, whether they are a renter or they live in a, an area that has trees and can't get to the sun, it's available through a model that's been pretty creative and, and very effective. So that has been one area. But on, as, as in, in terms of the impact, um, it's another source of, of power is the way we look at it and how it fits into the grid is very important and we're making the adjustments because the, the traditional way that the grid was built was basically not designed to have the, the fluctuation in, in power sources coming as they are. But that's not an excuse, that's just a reality of how things are going and we're making adjustments. As a matter of fact, in, our, in my testimony, I mentioned that we have a macro grid project that is, is an experimentation opportunity for us to see how it can be more fully deployed throughout the whole state uh, with, with other systems and across the nation because it actually is a collaboration between our national association and our, our state GNT. Well, I, I just want to give a shout out to a wonderful project in my district, the town of Peterborough, New Hampshire, where they took a water treatment facility that had big ponds and they used uh, USDA funding for a much more efficient 
tertiary water treatment plant, and then they took the seven acres where the ponds had been and filled it in and covered the whole thing with solar, and it's the whole town is using it, so it's great. Thank you. Julie, <coughs> time to start. Uh, Mr. Yoho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for enduring a long meeting, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, I'd like to expound on um, what Chairman Lucas was talking about, but before that, I want to mention what uh, Congressman Crawford said about the horse. Buying the horse is the cheap part, being a veterinarian, I know that. And uh, uh, that's the easy part. And I, I think I want to start with you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, with the land grant universities, and I come, I hail from Florida, the University of Florida, Double Gator, and uh, uh, the great facilities. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a marvel. I went to vet school there. Their vet school would put a lot of human hospitals to shame. Great facility. And then we met with the uh, director of IFAS, um, and he was talking about they need more facilities, and we've got to build them. And, and yet they're complaining about the maintenance of, of maintaining them. So I'm going to praise my university. I'm going to pick on them a little bit because I know this applies to all universities in the land grant situation. When we put these infrastructures in, sometimes they become a Taj Mahal. And they're looking at expanding a research facility. We were just down there on an ag tour, and they were talking about the new research facility they're going to put in, state of the art. But I worry about the maintenance of this. And so when you put in a project, what do you do for long-term maintenance? And before you answer that, I want to add that I was talking to somebody that is in charge of a municipality, their infrastructure as far as their water, wastewater. And I asked him, I said, what do you build into the project to take care of it for the maintenance and replacement 10, 15, 20 years down the road? He shocked me because he says, oh, we don't plan on that. Oh. What do you do when you guys design something as you're the Association for Public Land Grants, when you sit down and you're in your think tanks and you're talking to people, yes, build this nice facility, but where is the funding for the maintenance? Because where we're at today, and uh, Chairman Lucas brought this up, the competitiveness and the productivity of what we have today is based on what we invested 150 mm -hmm. years ago, and now we're at the point where we haven't kept up with that. How do we get beyond that for the next generation so that your researcher, your top researcher stays at your university and that it invites the new ones? What's your recommendations on that? Well, thank you, Congressman. I, I think, and, and we, we talked about this in one of the reports that, that uh, preceded this, and that was that basically if, if you're going to get federal funds, you, you need to have a stewardship plan as part of the proposal. In other words, to answer your question, uh, before you ever are granted the funds. So I think it's, it's a best practice that we've shirked, and, and just as the fellow you talked with uh, perhaps uh, may have in, in the water treatment system. So I think we need to build it in at the beginning. And one of the ways that we are already doing that is if someone comes to us and says they want to give us land, but they want us to keep it forever so that it doesn't get developed and so on and so forth, that's great. And what we say to them is we'll do that under one condition provide us an endowment that will cover those management, those maintenance costs. Let, well, so we need to do the same with anything we build. Let me ask you about that because the endowments, I, I know some of these universities are sitting on billion, a billion or billions of dollars endowment. Uh, the question that I have here is what are some of the ways that the institutions are looking beyond federal appropriations to modernize the facilities and equipment? Keep in mind where we are as a nation. We're at $20 trillion in debt, and we've got to bend that cost curve, or this is going to get worse next year and the next year. Um, go ahead. So I, I think, well, for one thing, it, it's always going to be a mixed package. So federal funds are part of it. They're never going to be the, the whole package. State funds have got to be part of it, university funds and, and others. Uh, if it involves teaching, student fees end up coming and helping to cover it as well. Philanthropy is huge. Uh, it's, it's a big part of it, uh, certainly for us and I think for a lot of universities. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's part of the, the mixed package, I guess, is that, uh, uh, we, but, but I think the, the opportunity here at the federal level is, is to use federal funds to bring that other money. In other words, to make it contingent. You only get the federal funds if you're able to match it with right. these other sources. I'm going to move on to another question. I'm running out of time. Ms. Otwell. Um, so many times we can bring the infrastructure, the rural broadband, so far. How do you go that last mile? Uh, what's the best way to go? Because as you said, you might have one or two people per square mile. Who's, who should be responsible for that? And is there a smarter way to do it? And then keeping in mind 20-year replacement or maintenance of that. 
Uh, we've got 20 seconds. Okay, that's exactly. We are looking to put in future-proof networks as much as possible. If you're going to go through putting in a piece of fiber into the ground, you want it to be what will last for 20, 30 years. Some of those older networks, there's really not a mid-range network. The older networks, they're already almost obsolete for what we are going to need them for in just a few years. So there are different technologies. You almost always need that fiber I'm out of time, and I'll reach out to you. Thank you, ma'am, because I want to follow up. Gentlemen's time is starting. Ms. Soto, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the honor of representing Central Florida, um, citrus and cattle country, and you know we in the citrus areas are facing a huge crisis with citrus greening. O over 70 percent of our reduction uh, of our production is down from peak production, and as we're developing resistant rootstocks um, that are currently um, about to be deployed, we have a we're going to need an ability to be able to get these out into the field quite a bit. And I want to thank you, Mr. Halverson, you and uh, CoBank for your partnership with our citrus producers. So if we were able to get out a lot of these uh, resistant rootstocks, are you prepared uh, with your bank to work with our growers and, and government to help really deploy these, even if they're semi-resistant and getting us closer to addressing this great crisis? Absolutely we are. I mean, that's really why the farm credit system is here to support agriculture. Uh, there are risks obviously associated with that, and the, and the industry is facing some really catastrophic and difficulties. Uh, we, we will absolutely be able and willing and, uh, to, uh, to support the growers through uh, other farm credit association institutions that will lend directly to the growers, but also to the co-ops uh, as well. Well, as we continue on our quest for the resistant proof citrus greening rootstock. In the meantime, there's a, a lot of good strains that are being developed right now. Uh, the second thing I'd like to talk about is organics. Um, as we know, investments in infrastructure are key to spurring more production of organics, including organic grain. And since it has to be processed in a facility that is certified to handle organic products, uh, it could require a lot of in investment in infrastructure. So how can CoBank and other of our ag lenders uh, help with these organic hotspots to bring more opportunities to our rural economy? Well, there's, there's clearly a lot of dynamic change going on in agricultural production. Uh, or, or organic production is, is a part of that. And without getting into, into uh, too much detail about the mechanisms and mechanics of becoming organically certified and otherwise, you know, we, the farm credit system, we, CoBank, we finance everybody. We finance organic producers, not organic producers. What I would say is, you know, we're, we're delighted to be focused and to have the committee's attention as well focused on infrastructure because whether you're an organic producer or not an organic producer, all of these producers are going to benefit from the type of uh, quality of, uh, of infrastructure that we're focused on providing for them. Well, I'd strongly uh, encourage you all to consider pilot programs on the subject, um, being that the profit margins are pretty good, and they really bode well for the future of our American farmers. Uh, turning next, you know, this committee is about new infrastructure, which is really opportunity uh, in rural America. And I know that um, our national rural electric cooperatives are really uh, leading the way in, uh, in renewable energy. And, uh, Mr. Wynn, you may be familiar of the town of Clewiston in Florida, which is run predominantly by bagasse, which is a byproduct of, of sugar. Where, where are we with uh, renewables and going forward? How key is that going to be in, uh, in delivering energy in, in our rural communities? I think you, you said it in, in terms of its deployment. NRECA and its member systems has been very uh, aggressive in many ways and very proactive in terms of deploying renewable energy. Our, many of our cooperatives are, are developing systems on their, on their utility lines uh, to help with, uh, mo help to modernize the system, help them become more resilient. So we, we've really embraced that. I think it's going to be, it is con conceived as a part of our future and uh, we're, we're embracing that. Well, I strongly encourage you to consider continuing doing that, you know, whether it be biofuels through byproducts of uh, commodities that aren't used, uh, whether it be uh, hydroelectric or solar, these are all great opportunities for areas that may not um, have access to other sources. And I want to end uh, with uh, you, Ms. Otwell. We have uh, certain fields in Florida where they have Wi-Fi to be able to measure how tall a crop is or sensors to develop um, 
when they need to have more water and nutrients. So do we have that capability now in most of our farms based upon our broadband access to really have those types of high-tech opportunities available? Absolutely, and we are trying to build to as many farms as we possibly can. And with a fully funded USF uh, budget, we will have the ability to make those investments knowing that there is a business case to build out to the most rural farms in those areas. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back, Mr. Uh, Bott. Oh, sorry, Mr. Thompson, five minutes. False start. Mr. Thompson, five minutes. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. And, uh, and thanks for this, this uh, important hearing as well, um, looking at the state of infrastructure in rural America. Uh, uh, Mr. McManus, uh, I'm a, uh, I've got a close working relationship with my, uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Rural Water Association. I appreciate what you all do at, uh, at the state level and certainly our National Rural Waters Association. Um, I mean, we're, uh, we're, we tend to hear a lot, when we talk especially potable water, we, we kind of hear about some cities that have had some issues, but you know, I know when some of my townships and boroughs are replacing water lines, we're still finding some wooden water lines. And uh, um, so my question for you is, uh, you recommended uh, allowing not-for-profit organizations to take over some of the non-inherently governmental activities and functions of USDA. What activities are you talking about, and how would you how would this suggestion improve the ability of systems like yours to build infrastructure and serve our uh, our uh, ratepayers? I've been doing USDA rural development loan and loan and grant applications for 17 years at East Rondo, and I can tell you the most difficult part is the the bureaucracy of the waiting process of the back and forth between the funding agency and, and the entity. And what we're proposing is that nonprofits would be able to do the uh, loan processing and servicing functions that, that, that is difficult in particular for small communities to follow the process. And I, I mentioned in my testimony attachment C, the 90 points that the individual systems have to do on the checklist, I think is greatly beneficial if you had an individual whose sole function in life was to help the system and the USDA employees that are processing the loans to get a complete package from the applicant initially up front and then to push that through with the USDA employees. That's, that's the exact type of assistance we're talking about. Hands-on, checking the list off with the, with the customer, the applicant, and then helping the USDA employee verify their end of it as well. Very good, thank you. Well, on the theme of bureaucracy, um, I had, uh, um, uh, uh, and how that impacts on infrastructure, I had the opportunity to go to the White House last week and for a luncheon, small luncheon, and uh, bipartisan, but it was on infrastructure. Really pleased to hear the White House, the President's committed to make sure that there's some type of rural title uh, within that, which is outstanding. I know Secretary Purdue's doing a lot of work with that. Um, but uh, uh, it was interesting to me that uh, the numbers were uh, the federal government does uh, owns, I guess, if you want to put it that way, about eight percent of infrastructure. Uh, we fund twelve to fourteen percent of it, but we permit a hundred percent of uh, of infrastructure. And uh, the the um, countries like Australia, which is uh, pretty green actually in their infrastructure, is my understanding, uh, they've reduced their their permitting time down to eighteen months. At considerable economic activity uh, that it's increased. Our average for this country is 10 years, not a year and a half. And so my, so my question, just a broad question, when it comes to infrastructure in rural America, and Ms. Otwell already outlined some strategies on how to do this without really cutting any, you know, not, without compromising the, the environment, um, how, uh, how important is this in terms of infrastructure in rural America? What would it mean for you or your members uh, if we were able to to get the, the permitting streamlined, uh, get it closer to Australia versus our current 10 years. I'll just throw that open to whoever would like to respond. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, once again, for our companies, the less time and re energy and resources we have to spend on permitting for multiple agencies and on individual basis, the more time we have to build broadband. Mr. McManus. And I'd add, Mr. Congressman, that the faster you can get when you've identified a need in your system that you need the infrastructure, the faster you can get that built, the, the less the inflation factor of, of your identified cost is going to have on eating away at what you're applying for. If you're sitting waiting 
because of permitting and other issues, the money that you're trying to apply for is no, not going to be sufficient by the time you get to construction, and you're going to have to turn around and apply for another loan or whatever it may be to find that additional financing to actually complete the project if there's a long delay in the permitting. So it has a direct impact on the end user on the cost that they'll end up paying for the project itself. Uh, Mr. Halverson, I um, appreciate uh, uh, CoBank and Farm Credit. Um, you know, one of the, and I appreciate your testimony you had about the, your, the, the role of, uh, of both with uh, our, our crit rural critical access hospitals. I mean, we've had, uh, I think, 80 rural hospitals closed since 2010. You know, and part of that is just dealing with the bureaucracy, costs, you know, inefficiencies. And so I'm out of time, but I just want to say I appreciate the role that both CoBank and Farm Credit has played uh, because if you don't, we don't have those facilities in our rural communities. Uh, I don't care how you pay for health care. We don't have access to health care. So thank you. So much time expired. Mr. Costa, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is a very important conversation. I thank the chair and the ranking member for holding this hearing. A lot has been discussed about broadband. I'm not going to go back over that area. Obviously, it's important. Transportation, access to our markets to move our farm products to um, where they need to go uh, is clearly critical, not only for our population centers, but also for our export purposes. Water has been discussed earlier. Um, it seems to me the focus of the discussion, though, on water has been more as it relates to local water quality issues and water access to rural communities. Uh, I don't know that any of you have touched upon the notion possibly in this effort uh, to develop a bipartisan um, you know, big uh, infrastructure investment in America that we're considering water projects uh, that have been so important to the West uh, for generations. I'm talking about major water projects to investing in uh, using not only uh, investments in reservoirs, but um, the kinds of investments that we might see in groundwater recharge and, and using all the water management tools in our water toolbox to uh, take advantage of the changes that are occurring. So what I'd like to ask the witnesses is, uh, let's say that we come together with, the President's talked about a trillion dollar plus package, and we're still uh, grappling on how we finance that. But it seems to me that uh, the rural component is going to be some part of it if we're successful. Now, is it going to be 20 percent of it, 25 percent of it? I mean, I know this committee would like to obviously uh, you know, put our stake out there in terms of what we think is appropriate for rural America that often gets overlooked. So I'd like you to respond to, to that. I'd also like you to respond to the notion of leveraging. Uh, we have a number of uh, localities, either counties, uh, communities, uh, service districts, that uh, put together financing to help deal with their water needs, their infrastructure needs. Are there transportation needs? States that have put up significant money, that have skin in the game. Uh, one of the ways that we always finance projects here is federal, state, and local funding. So are we going to acknowledge and, and reward those localities or those states that already are making investments so that we can further leverage the potential of this infrastructure package? Who would like to address those basic concepts? Because, I mean, we all have our wish list. And then finally, how do we prioritize? Because we all got our wish list, but how do we prioritize where the greatest needs are for rural America? Knowing that, that uh, transportation, water, and, uh, and communications, i.e. broadband and others, are critical needs. Well, so uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, there's a lot to cover there, and I promise I won't try to do it all. But, but uh, you know, I think in, in terms of the investment and, and attracting other money, leveraging money, I think part of it is uh, 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 thinking about what, what is it that attracts private capital, for example. And, and generally, it's, it's the promise of a return on that investment. And so the public-private partnerships have worked very well in other sectors. Uh, could they apply here? Are, are there ap applications, whether it's perhaps with irrigation projects, like, like you've suggested, or, or others, where, uh, where there's something to be 
earned over the long term that would justify private invested in, investment in those projects. Um, and so, you know, that's one example. And, and as I said earlier, I think one of the things is whatever uh, federal funds come, I, I, they, they, they really need to be tied to other sources of funding or the federal money doesn't come. So we should reward <clears throat> states and localities that already have skin in the game. Absolutely. As we construct the package. How do we prioritize? Um, if, if I could, I, I think that's a, that's a difficult question because I guarantee you if you went around to 20 people and said, let's prioritize where the projects should go. You're no, I know it's difficult. That's why I'm 20 the You're going to get 20 We're different gonna, answers. I, 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 and I don't want to end up with just a political response in the legislation hopefully we come together with because I, we know how the political responses usually get handled. Well, I would look to get answers from your constituents and then try to get a group like this to come together and, and try to make that prioritization because because everybody's, I mean, if we went around here today and you, you saw all the questions that were asked. No, and the needs are going to be far greater than what we're funding that we'll be able to come Absolutely. up Absolutely. And that's why it's important to prioritize based upon, I think, uh, some sort of criteria that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can tell you what that criteria is. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Boss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Calhoun, uh, in your opening testimony, you referred to the need for to fund 25 different inland waterway modernization projects. Uh, can you tell us the committee like where those what those are, and where they're located, what benefits they'll have for the bottom line for the shippers, and, and, and that use the waterways? Uh, yes, certainly. The, um, the 25 projects are projects that are, have been authorized but not appropriated by Congress over the years. Um, a number of years ago, the Inland Waterway User Board came together with the Corps of Engineers and tried to prioritize these projects in the order of importance based on the criteria of risk of failure, where the greatest economic uh, benefit was the nation, a number of different criteria. And that list at the time was developed and at a point in time, and of course that's a, as time changes, that list could change too, but that's, that's where the list came from. And, and it's all over the system. It's, it's in the Gulf regions, it's on the upper Midwest, it's uh, in the Pittsburgh area, it's all over the navigable system. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on the importance of the federal and non-federal levy systems? And, and I'll show you, tell you where I'm going with this, but um, uh, as far as navigation and the importance of flood protection. Well, n navigation is just one of the values of, of the in the waterway system. Uh, certainly, flood protection, irrigation, water use. We talked about water use. Some in California, you pay for water. You don't pay for water off the Mississippi River. Right. So there's a number of different beneficiaries. The problem we've had funding the river historically is only one of the beneficiaries pays anything into the trust fund, which is why the trust fund is low today. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of beneficiaries and and uh, the trick has been, you know, how do, how do you charge someone on the other side of the levy for that, having that levy there? And, and, and when you talk about privatizing the locks, how do you charge recreational boaters for using it, you know, for the improvement on the value of real estate? Municipalities don't pay for water. So, you know, there's a lot of value being created, but, but nobody's being charged. And for the first 200 years in the nation, nobody got charged anything. You know, so it's 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 a it's a more recent trend that we want to try to have you know the the users pay that back. But so far, we've only identified one user that we've been able to tax. Right, Mr. Halverson. Uh, as a follow up to to the question I just asked on the importance of levies in Illinois, the Lynn Small levy in my district is a non-federal levy that was breached. Uh, what they refer to as the holiday flood of 2015 and 2016. Let me tell you, it was no holiday. Um, there's a, a mile-wide gap in this levy now, and this leaves about 38,000 acres of productive farmland and several rural communities without any flood protection. Would, far, would Farm Credit or any other lender, for that matter, engage with a levy district to finance a reconstruction of the non-federal levies in the absence of any uh, involvement with the Army Corps of Engineers? Uh, that is a very good question, I'm sure. Uh, I, I can't tell you the answer off the top of my head. I would give you a commitment that we'll go and research that and come back to you in okay. writing. We're trying desperately to figure out uh, the damage. I'm trying, matter of fact, one reason why I wasn't here earlier is we were in transportation dealing with the Army Corps specifically on this, 
because not only is if we don't get that one repaired, it's for not only for the farmland, but also for navigational purposes. Because if you look at the state of Illinois and you go down to the bottom, there's a place where the river bends like this. Yeah. It's actually called the dog tooth bend. It's about, a, about 17 miles around, drops 12 feet in that 17 miles. Mm -hmm. If that levee is not put, replaced back, it's already cut a better than a mile of the three miles across and navigation from New Orleans to the Great Lakes will be stopped. And so we're trying desperately to express how important it is to put the protection back in place. And uh, it's amazing when dealing with bureaucracies how we can't get things done. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Mr. Lawson, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, when I left the committee, uh, you all was talking about the tremendous amount of uh, infrastructure research uh, that the land-grant institution had such a back backlog, so I want to ask a question about that. But I was deeply concerned about the co-ops because I can recall uh, when I was growing up in the rural areas, uh, when we first uh, got electricity, my brother and I, I stayed up all night trying to see what was going to happen with that light, but I never did go out, you know, and, and so uh, so uh, that was very interesting. But my question today centers around, uh, there are a thousand uh, people that are moving to Florida a day. And, uh, and we're told that a lot of these people now, they wanted to be on the coastline, but now uh, they're moving into uh, rural areas where, uh, where uh, they're gonna be served by uh, co-ops. Uh, my question would be, what kind of pressure does this put on electric co-ops? Uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, uh, because of that many people coming, and Florida is now the third largest state in terms of population uh, in America, but it's going to put a considerable amount of pressure on co-ops. How are they going to be able to handle it? Well, I think we're uh, welcoming growth for most co-ops. I know many of us don't get an opportunity to see growth. I know the ones in Florida are experiencing that, but the, the, the good thing about it is that uh, I think the good news is that we have access to capital, which is the biggest restraint that we would probably run into in terms of getting people to build the lines. That's something that we can always do, but fortunately we have three very good sources of capital. CoBank is, is one, uh, our National Rural, Elect Rural, or RUS is the other, and CFC is another. So, and then there, there are syndications that can happen to bring other people to the table to, to do the financing. So. I don't really see many barriers, but it, it, it barriers to the growth, but it's uh, certainly something that can be managed and has been managed in other areas. Okay, and I guess the question would be, uh, with the president proposal uh, to cut back, you know, uh, rural funding, uh, you know, serving in the uh, Florida legislature for a number of years, around about 28 years, House and Senate, uh, one of the greatest things that uh, uh, when the gavel went down that we could carry back well, water projects, you know, uh, water projects uh, from these local governments in those areas, which I had about 13 rural counties that I was ser serving in, uh, water, water projects meant everything to them. And so when they're doing this uh, farm bill, and I know the chairman here, they probably referred to it, it would be just devastating uh, to cut back on water projects uh, for rural areas. And, I, and if you've already talked about it, I mean, I, I don't think there's enough talking that we can do about it. So I would ask Mr. Is it, is it Havison, uh, uh, would you comment on that? Well, I, I'd share your, uh, your focus and your concern, Representative Lawson. Uh, I, I refer to my testimony, the fact that there's somewhere in the zip code of $190 billion worth of investment required in, in, in refurbishing and reinvesting in the nation's uh, water infrastructure, uh, that number gets bigger every day, not smaller. Uh, it's, it's a deferred maintenance bill. So, you know, we are uh, uh, making contributions as CoBank and the farm credit system. We would like to do more, uh, but we can only make a small dent in what is a very large uh, uh, total requirement there. But we are uh, very passionately committed to doing so, and, and that's why we're so uh, encouraged by the committee's uh, interest in moving this forward and, and expanding that activity. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Kuhn, I got a little bit of time left. Uh, uh, do you, uh, and you might have mentioned, I caught the back end when I go on another committee, what are universities doing to try to make up for all of the 
infrastructure backlog that they have in terms of research? We're, we're looking for help everywhere we can get it. <laughs> but, but so basically, it's, it's, uh, it, it ends up being pretty much uh, crisis management. You know, if we've got uh, freezers that go down, we've got to go and address that right away. And so that takes our attention away from whatever else we might have been doing. So we, we, we really need to step back uh, and develop more, more complete plans that are, that are more sustainable than uh, the current reactionary mode that we're operating in. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I know one thing I was, uh, in your closing argument, if you could say, how does this relate with our competition with other countries? Yeah. Thank you. Chairman, yields back. Yeah. Mr. Arrington, you have questions? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Five minutes. I do. Um, thank you all for coming, and we've got a budget markup today. I apologize for coming in late. Um, but uh, Ports to Plains is an initiative uh, transportation infrastructure initiative to enhance and expand uh, transportation uh, in middle America essentially from Texas to Canada probably most of you are familiar with it and again I apologize if you've re uh, if I'm making you repeat yourself but uh, talk about initiatives like ports to plains and and the transportation infrastructure and how important that is, and how would you rank order that, and what thoughts do you have, uh, uh, you know, strategically, on that component of sustainable rural communities and getting our food, fuel, and fiber to market? And anybody can take the question, and just kind of whoever wants to volunteer first, Mr. Calhoun. They seem to think you have the answer to this. <laughs> well, I, I, that was a draft, by the way. I don't know. There was I volunteered, but. Um, I, I'm not familiar with the initiative that, that you're speaking about, um, which is why I didn't volunteer. But, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the things when we talk about the inland waterways, one of the problems that we, we face is we're not actually under the jurisdiction of the Transportation Department. It comes on the Army Corps of Engineers, so it's, it's handled in a, in, a, in a different fashion. So, you know, when you talk about the things that I talked about today, you know, the, you know, we've talked a lot about broadband and everything else, but just physically the roads and bridges to get around this country, which are getting old and dilapidated and, and in, in need of, of, uh, of fixing up. So I, th there's just a, there's a large job to do, and I think it needs to be done as, in a coordinated fashion as much as we can. I don't know that I answered your yeah, question. Yeah, no, that's great. I'd just supplement that by saying the, uh, the administration is very focused on, on international trade and our trade balance and the like, and agriculture is one of the biggest single positive contributors to the trade balance and the current account balance of the United States. Uh, for many, many years, that looks likely to be the case in the future, provided we can continue to innovate and continue to invest in our backlog of, of infrastructure weaknesses. We need to be able to get our agricultural production from the farm gate to a waterway, and, and ultimately, a quarter to a third of all of our agricultural production gets exported to foreign markets. So it is vitally important, uh, and it's why the Rebuild Rural Coalition is very, very focused on it, because our long-term trade, our long-term uh, competitiveness for, for, for rural America and the quality of life is very dependent on our ability to get our products to the marketplace. Yeah, it's last year. I think the U.S. ag exports were about 21. Point, the contributed 21.5 billion dollars to the balance of trade, and trade is very important to this country. And and as I talked in my remarks, you know, feeding a, a growing world is going to be very important to this country. And and you cannot do it without the infrastructure. And the other thing that we haven't talked about here much today is just the length of time it takes to build this infrastructure and and get to where we need to be. Some of these projects, particularly on the inland waterway system, have taken you know, 10, 15, 20 years to build, and then the permitting process before that. So if you start today, you're not going to be done for a decade, and, and we just can't afford to delay this process any longer. Thanks again for your, your time, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back his time. Uh, thank you all. Mr. Halverson, given the, the impact or the role that uh, Rebuild Rural Coalition had on our on putting a panel together today, would you give us a couple of seconds or a couple of sentences on uh, how you've been doing with that coalition, and are you worried uh, that, po that partisan politics might uh, creep into what you're trying to do and accomplish, and if that's the case, what are you doing to try to avoid that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been serving in a, in a call it a convening capacity for, for, for that coalition. We're deeply excited and enthusiastic about the fact that we've been able to uh, 
convene such a broad and deep uh, uh, group of, of uh, institutions around what uh, others have said should be and hopefully will be uh, a relatively bipartisan a a agenda. There's not a lot of seemingly, not a lot of things people can agree on these days, uh, particularly here. Uh, we're hopeful and optimistic based on the, the dialogue we're having within that coalition that, that this is a, a, a bipartisan consensus. I think the devil's in the details and there will be challenges ahead if we get legislation or, or an ability to mobilize some of the resources that everybody is interested in in, in, in addressing the question that Mr. Costa asked, which is, I, I believe, which is how do you allocate that and so forth. But hopefully that good old-fashioned allocation mechanism that Congress has been familiar with for over 200 years can be uh, digested in a, in a relatively nonpartisan way. And, and we're hopeful and optimistic and we'll do everything uh, within that coalition to support your efforts in that regard. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for what the coalition is doing and, and uh, uh, the impact that you're going to, to have. Uh, we're at a great uh, point uh, with uh, two opportunities to address this, uh, this broad spectrum of challenges. We'll have the uh, infrastructure bill we'll probably be before the farm bill, but uh, we'll have the infrastructure bill as well as the farm bill itself to, uh, to take a look. The bad news about the farm bill is we're going to have a whole lot less, uh, fewer resources uh, this time that we did in 14 to uh, to get that done, which will present terrific challenges. Uh, Mr. Costa asked about setting priorities. Uh, we're going to get an exercise in trying to having to do that because we'll have to get the farm bill done. I appreciate uh, all of you coming to D.C. today and uh, presenting a very uh, clear statement as to why this is important to rural America, uh, the, uh, the impact that uh, across the entire spectrum. All your comments are very timely and much appreciated, and, and uh, we hope there are other people listening and paying attention to this today because uh, this is a, a big deal to the folks of us who, uh, like Jody and I, who live in, uh, in rural America, and so we appreciate that. The, um, under the rules of the committee, today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplemental written responses from the witnesses to any question posed by a member. The hearing on Committee of Agriculture is adjourned. Thank you.